So um, next week, talking to Christos Goodrow. I'm not sure if you're familiar who he is, but he's the VP of engineering, head of the quote unquote YouTube algorithm nice. or the search and discovery. So yeah. let me ask first high level, do you have, do you have a question for him that if you can get an answer, honest answer that you would ask, but more generally, how do you think about the YouTube algorithm that drives some of the motivation behind, no, no, some of the design decisions you make as you ask and answer some of the questions you do, how would you improve this algorithm in your mind in general? So it's just the, what would you ask him? And outside of that, how would you like to see the algorithm improve? Well, I think of the algorithm as a mirror. It reflects what people put in. And we don't always like what we see in that mirror. From the individual mirror to the individual mirror to the society. Both. In the aggregate, it's reflecting back what people on average want to watch. And when you see things being recommended to you, it's reflecting back what it thinks you want to see. And specifically, I would guess that it's not just what you want to see, but what you will click on and what you will watch some of and stay on YouTube uh, because of. Um, I don't think that, this is all me guessing, but I don't think that YouTube cares if you only watch like a second of a video, as long as th the next thing you do is open another video. If you close the app or close the site, that's a problem for them because they're not a subscription platform. They're not like, look, you're giving us 20 bucks a month no matter what, so who cares? They need you to watch and spend time there and see ads. So one of the things I'm curious about whether they do consider longer term sort of develop, you, your longer term development as a human being, which I think ultimately will make you feel better about using YouTube in the long term and allowing you to stick with it for longer. Because even if you feed the dopamine rush in the short term and you keep clicking on, on cat videos, the eventually you sort of wake up like from a drug and say, I need to quit this. So I wonder how much they're trying to optimize for the long term. Because when I look at the, you know, your videos aren't exactly a, sort of no offense, but they're not the most clickable. They're both the most clickable and I feel I watched the entire thing and I feel a better human after I watched it, right? So like, they're not Pretty just uh, optimizing for the clickability because uh, this is, so, so I, I hope, so m my thought is how do you think of it? And does it affect your own content? Like how deep you go, how profound you explore like, the directions and so on. I, I've been really lucky in that I don't, worry too much about the algorithm. I mean, look at my thumbnails. I don't really right. go too wild with them. And with Minefield, where I'm in partnership with YouTube on the thumbnails, I'm often like, let's pull this back. Let's be right. mysterious. I, usually I'm just trying to do what everyone else is not doing. Right. So if everyone's doing crazy Photoshop whoa, kind yeah, of thumbnails, yeah, exactly. I'm like, what if the thumbnails just align? Yeah. yeah. And what if the title is just a word? <laughs> yeah. And I, I kind of feel like all of the Vsauce channels have cultivated an audience that expects that. And so they would rather Jake make a video that's just called Stains yeah. than one called, I explored Stains, yeah. shocking. Yeah. But there are other <laughs> audiences out there that want that. And you know, I think most people kind of you know want what you see the algorithm favoring, which is mainstream traditional celebrity and news kind of information. I mean, that's what makes YouTube really different than other streaming platforms. No one's like, What's going on in the world? I'll open up Netflix to find out. But you do open up Twitter to find that out. You open up Facebook. You can open up YouTube because you'll see that the trending videos are like what happened amongst the traditional mainstream people in different industries. And that's what's being shown. And it's it's not necessarily YouTube saying we want that to be what you see. It's that that's what people click on. When they see Ariana Grande, you know, reads a love letter from like her high school sweetheart, they're like, I want to see that. And when they see a video from me that's got some lines in math and it's called Law and Causes, they're like, well, <laughs> I mean, that I, I'm just on the bus. Like, I don't have time to dive into a whole lesson. So, you know, before you get super mad at YouTube, you should say, really, they're just reflecting back human behavior. Is there something you would improve about the algorithm 
knowing, of course, that uh, as far as we're concerned, it's a black box, so we don't know how it works. Right, and I don't think that even anyone at YouTube really knows what it's doing. They That's know right. what they've tweaked, but then it learns. I think that it learns and it decides how to behave. And sometimes uh, the YouTube employees are left going, I don't know. Maybe we should like change the value of how much it you know right. worries about watch time. And maybe it should worry more about something else. I don't know. But I mean, I would like to see... I don't know what they're doing and not doing. Well, is there a conversation that you think they should be having just in, internally, whether they're having it or not? Is there something, should they be thinking about the long-term future? Should they be thinking about educational content and uh, whether that's educating about what just happened in the world today, news or educational content, like what you're providing, which is asking big sort of timeless questions about how the way the world works. Well, it, it's interesting. What, what should they think about? Right. Because it's called YouTube, not our tube. And <laughs> yeah. that's why I think they have so many phenomenal educational creators. Yes. You don't have shows like Three Blue, One Brown or Physics Girl or Looking Glass Universe or Up yes. and Atom or Brain Scoop or, um, I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah. They aren't on Amazon Prime and Netflix and, yeah. and they don't have commissioned shows from those platforms. It's all organically happening because there are people out there that want to share their passion for learning, that want to share their curiosity. And YouTube could, you know, promote those kinds of shows more. But like, first of all, they probably wouldn't get as many clicks and YouTube needs to make sure that the average user is always clicking and staying on the site. Right. They could still promote it more for the good of society, but then we're making some really weird claims about what's good for society because I think that cat videos are also an incredibly important part of what it means to be a human. Yeah. I've mentioned this quote before from Unamuno about, look, I've seen a cat like estimate distances and calculate a jump, you know, more often than I've seen a cat cry. And so <laughs> Things that that play with our emotions and make us feel things can be cheesy and can feel cheap, but like, man, that's very human. And so even the dumbest vlog is still so important mm. that I don't think it. I have a better claim to take its spot than it has to have that spot. Yeah, so it puts, it puts a mirror to us, the, the beautiful parts, the ugly parts, the shallow parts, the deep parts, yeah, you're right. What I would like to see is, you know, I. I I miss the days when engaging with content on YouTube helped push it into my subscribers' timelines. Mm. It used to be that when I liked a video, say from Veritasium, it would show up in the feed on the front page of the app or the website mm -hmm. of my subscribers. And I knew that if I liked a video, I could send it 100,000 views or more. That no longer is true. But I think that was a good user experience. When I subscribe to someone, when I'm following them, I want to see more of what they like. Yeah. I want them to also curate the feed for me. And I think that Twitter and Facebook are doing that in also some ways that are, are kind of annoying, yeah. but I would like that to happen more. And I think we would see communities mm. being stronger on YouTube if it was that way, instead of YouTube going, well, technically Michael liked this Veritasium video, but people are way more likely to click on carpool karaoke. So I don't even care who they are. Just give them that. Not saying anything against carpool karaoke, that is a extremely important part of our society, what it means to be a human on earth, yeah. you know, but- um, I'll say it, it sucks, but- uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I'm a lot of people would just, disagree with yes. you and they should be able to see as much of that as they want. Yes. And I think even people who don't think they like it should still be really aware of it because it's such an important thing and such an influential thing. But yeah, I just wish that like new channels I discover and that I subscribe to, I wish that my subscribers found out about that because especially in the education community, a rising tide floats all boats. If you watch a video from Number File, you're just more likely to want to watch an episode from me, whether it be on Vsauce One or Ding. It's not it's not competitive in the way that traditional TV was, where it's like, well, if you tune into that show, it means you're not watching mine because they both air at the same time. So helping each other out through collaborations takes a lot of work, but just through engaging, commenting on their videos, liking their videos, subscribing to them, whatever, that I would love to see become easier and more powerful. Sometimes, we're sorry. How does neural networks change this, just to even linger on this topic, change this idea of statistics, how big of a pie statistics is within the machine learning thing? Like, because it sounds like hyperparameters and also just the role of data 
you know, this people are starting to use this terminology of software 2.0, which is like the act of programming as a, as a, like you're a designer in the hyperparameter space of neural networks, and you're also the collector and the organizer and the cleaner uh, of the data, and that's part of the programming. Uh, how, so, how did on the neurops versus ICML topic? What's the role of neural networks in redefining the size and the role of machine learning? Well, I can't. Say? I can't wait to, to to hear what Michael thinks about this. But um, I would add one. But you will. But <laughs> I, that's true. I will. I'll force myself to. I think the <laughs> the there's one other thing I would add to your description, which is the kind of software engineering part is what does it mean to debug, for example. Right. But this is a difference between uh, the kind of computational statistics view of machine learning and the co computational view of machine learning, uh, which is I think one is worried about the equation, as it were. And by, by the way, this is not a value judgment. I just think it's about perspective. But the kind of questions you would ask, you start asking yourself, well, what does it mean to program and develop and build the system is a very computer science-y view of the problem. I mean, when if you get on uh, data science Twitter and econ Twitter, you actually hear this a lot with the, uh, you know, the economist and the data scientist complaining about the machine learning people. Well, it's, it, you know, it's just statistics. And I don't know why they don't, don't see this, but they're not even asking the same questions. They're not thinking about it as a kind of programming problem. And I think that that really matters, just asking this question. I actually think it's a little different from uh, programming and hyperparameter space and, and sort of collecting the data. I, but I do think that that immersion really matters. So I'll give you a quick, a quick example of the way I think about this. So I teach machine learning. Michael and I have co-taught a machine learning class, which has now reached, I don't know, 10,000 people at least over the last several years or somewhere there's about. And my machine learning assignments are of this form. So the super, the first one is something like implement these five algorithms, you know, KNN and S, you know, SVMs and boosting and decision trees and neural networks, and maybe that's it, I can't remember. And when I say implement, I mean steal the code. I am completely uninterested. You get zero points for getting the thing to work. Mm -hmm. I don't want you spending your time worrying about uh, getting the corner case right of you know what happens when you are trying to normalize distances and the points on the thing, and so you divide by zero. I'm not interested in that, right? Mm -hmm. Steal the code. However, you're going to run those algorithms on two data sets. The data sets have to be interesting. What does it mean to be interesting? Well, data sets interesting if it reveals differences between algorithms, which presumably are all the same because they can represent whatever they can represent. And two data sets are interesting together if they show different differences, as it were. And you have to analyze them. You have to justify their interestingness and you have to analyze them in a whole bunch of ways. But all I care about is the data in your analysis, not the programming. And I occasionally end up in these long discussions with students. Well, I don't really, I copy and paste the things that I've said the other 15,000 <laughs> times it's come up, which is they go, but the only way to learn, really understand is to code them up, yeah. which is a very programmer, software engineering view of the world. If you don't program it, you don't understand it, which is, I, by the way, I think is wrong in a very specific way. But it is a way that you come to understand because then you have to wrestle with the algorithm. Mm -hmm. But the thing about machine learning is it's not just sorting numbers, where in some sense the data doesn't matter. What matters is, well, does the algorithm work on these abstract things, mm -hmm. one less than the other. In machine learning, the data matters. It, mm -hmm. it matters more than almost anything. Mm -hmm. And so, not everything, but almost anything. And so as a result, you have to live with the data and don't get distracted by the algorithm per se. And I think that that focus on the data and what it can tell you and what question it's actually answering for you, as opposed to the question you thought you were asking, is a key and important thing about machine learning and is a way that computationalists, as opposed to statisticians, bring a particular view about how to think about the process. The statisticians, by contrast, bring, I, I think I'd be willing to say, a better view about the kind of formal math that's behind it and what mm -hmm. an actual number ultimately is saying about the data. And those are both important, but they're also different. I didn't really think of it this way, is to build intuition about the role of data, the different characteristics of data by having two data sets that are different and they reveal the differences in the differences. Yeah. That's that's a really fascinating, that's a really interesting educational approach. The, the students love it, but not right away. No, they love they it They love the it end. later. They love it at the end, not at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> not well, even not even immediately after. I feel like it's there's a, a deep profound in. lesson about education there. Yeah. Th that uh you can't listen to students about whether what you're doing is the right or the wrong thing. Yeah. 
Well, as, as a wise uh, Michael Lippmann once said to me about children, which I think applies to teaching, is you have to give them what they need without bending to their will. And students are like that. You have to figure out what they need. You're a curator. Your whole job is to curate and to present because on their own, they're not going to necessarily know where to search. So you're providing pushes in some direction and learn space. Uh, and you have to give them what they need in a way that keeps them engaged enough so that they eventually discover what they want and they get the tools they need to go and learn other things. Also. You know, individual developers, maybe a 13-year-old sitting somewhere in Kansas or something like that, you know, they're sitting, they, they might not even have a GPU and or may have a single GPU, a 1080 or something like that. And there's this feeling like, well, how can I possibly compete or contribute to this world of AI if uh, scale is so important? So for, if you can comment on that, and in general, do you think we need to also in the future focus on uh, democratizing compute resources more, more or as much as we democratize the algorithms? Well, so the way that I think about it is that there's this space of, of possible progress, right? There's a space of ideas and sort of systems that, that will work, that will move us forward. And there's a portion of that space, and to some extent, an increasingly significant portion of that space that does just require massive compute resources. And for that, that I think that, that the answer is kind of clear and that part of why we have the structure that, that we do is because we think it's really important to be pushing the scale and to be you know building these large clusters and systems. But there's another part, portion of the space that isn't about the large scale compute that are these ideas that, and again, I think that for the ideas to really be impactful and really shine, that they should be ideas that if you scale them up would work way better than they do at small scale. Um, but that you can discover them without massive computational resources. And if you look at the history of, of recent developments, you think about things like the GAN or the VAE, that these are ones that I think you could come up with them uh, without having, and you know, in practice people did come up with, with them without having massive, massive computational resources. Right, I just saw- Go back. We already talked through a bunch of them, but are there some possible solutions to the bias that's present in our algorithms beyond what we just talked about? So I think there's, two paths. One is to figure out how to systematically do the feedback and correction. So right now it's ad hoc, right? It's a researcher identifies some outcomes that are not, don't seem to be fair, right? They publish it, they write about it, um, and the either the developer or the companies that have adopted the algorithms may try to fix it, right? And so it's really ad hoc and it's not systematic. There's, it's just, it's kind of like, I'm a researcher, that seems like an interesting problem, um, which means that there's a whole lot out there that's not being looked at, right? Because it's kind of researcher driven. Um, I, and, and I don't necessarily have a solution, but that process I think could be done a little bit better. Uh, one way is um, I'm going to poke a little bit at some of the corporations, mm -hmm. right? Like maybe the corporations, when they think about a product, they should, um, instead of, in addition to hiring these, you know, bug, they, they give these. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you, like you, awards when you find a bug. Yeah, you, find security, yeah security, security bug. Yeah. You know, let's, let's put it like, we will give the whatever the award is that we give for the people who find these security holes, find an ethics hole, right? Like yeah. find an unfairness hole and we will pay you X for each one you find. I mean, why can't they do that? Yeah. One is a win-win. They show that they're concerned about it, that this is important, and they don't have to necessarily dedicate it their own like internal resources. And it also means that everyone who has like their own bias lens, like I'm interested in age, and so I'll find the ones based on age, and I'm interested in gender, and right? Which means that you get like all of these different perspectives. But you think of it in a data-driven way. So like sort of, if we, if we look at a company like Twitter, it gets, it's under a lot of fire for discriminating against certain political beliefs. Correct. And sort of, there's a lot of people, this is the, the sad thing, because I know how hard the problem is, and I know the Twitter folks are working really hard at it, even Facebook that everyone seems to hate are working really hard at this. It, you know, w the kind of evidence that people bring is basically anecdotal evidence. Well, me or my friend, all we said is X, and for that we got banned. And 
and that's kind of a discussion of saying, well, look, that's usually, first of all, the whole thing is taken out of context. So they present sort of anecdotal evidence. And how are you supposed to, as a company, in a healthy way, have a discourse about what is and isn't ethical? What? How do we make algorithms ethical when people are just blowing everything? Like they're outraged about a particular, particular anecdotal evident piece of evidence that's very difficult to sort of contextualize in the big data driven way. Is it, do you have a hope for companies like Twitter and Facebook? Yeah, um, so I think there, there's a couple of things going on, right? Uh, first off, uh, the remember this whole aspect of we are becoming um, reliant on technology. We're also becoming reliant on um, a lot of these, um, the the apps and the resources that are provided, right? So some of it is kind of anger, like I need you, right? And yeah. you're not working for yeah, me, yeah, right? Not working for me, right? Um, but I think, <laughs> and, and so some of it, and I and I wish that um, there was a little bit of change of rethinking. So some of it is like, oh, we'll fix it in house. No, that's like okay. I'm a fox and I'm going to watch these hens because I think it's a problem that foxes eat hens. Yeah. No, right? Like use, like be good citizens and say, look, we have a problem and we are willing to open ourselves up for others to come in and look at it and not try to fix it in house. Because if you fix it in house, there's conflict of interest. If I find something, I'm probably going to want to fix it and hopefully the media won't pick it up. Right. And that then causes distrust because someone inside is going to be mad at you and go out and talk about how, yeah, they can the resume yeah. survey because it, <laughs> right. Like be us people. Like just say, look, we have this issue. Community, help us fix it. And we will give you like, you know, the bug finder fee if you do. So do you have a hope that the community, us as a human civilization on the whole is good and can be trusted to guide the future of our civilization into a positive direction. I think so. So I'm an optimist, right? Um, and you know, we there, there were some dark times in history. Always, um, I think now we're in one of those dark times. I truly do. In which aspect? The polarization. Um, and it's not just U.S., right? So if it was just U.S., I'd be like, yeah, it's a U.S. thing. But we're seeing it like worldwide. This polarization. And so I, I worry about that. But I do fundamentally believe that at the end of the day, people are good, right? And and why do I say that? Because anytime there's a scenario where people are in danger, and I will use, uh, so Atlanta, we had uh, Snowmageddon, and people can laugh about that. People at the time, so the city closed for, you know, little snow, but it was ice, and the city closed down. But you had people opening up their homes and saying, hey, you have nowhere to go, come to my house, right? Hotels were just saying like, sleep on the floor. Like places like, you know, the grocery stores were like, hey, here's food. There was no like, oh, how much are you gonna pay me? It was like this, such a community and like people who didn't know each other, strangers were just like, can I give you a ride home? And that was a point I was like, you know what? Like. That 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 reveals that the deeper thing is is uh, there's a compassionate love that we all have within us. It's just that when all of that is taken care of and get bored, we love drama. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and that's I, I think almost like the division is a sign of the times being good. Is that it's just entertaining on a, some unpleasant uh, mammalian level to watch to disagree with others, yeah. and Twitter and Facebook are actually taking advantage of that in a sense because it brings you back to the platform and they're advertiser driven so they make a lot of money so you go back and you click love doesn't sell quite as well in terms of advertisement uh, it doesn't do you think from a robotics perspective you know if you if you're kind of honest of what cars do they they kind of kind of threaten each other's life all the time so cars are very, I mean, in order to navigate intersections, there's an assertiveness, there's a risk taking. And if you were to reduce it to an objective function, there's a probability of murder in that function, meaning you killing another human being and you're using that. First of all, you, it has to be low enough 
to be acceptable to you on an ethical level as an individual human being, but it has to be high enough for people to respect you, to not sort of take advantage of you completely and jaywalk in front of you and so on. So, I mean, I don't think there's a right answer here, but what's how do we solve that? How how do we solve that from a robotics perspective when danger and human life is at stake? Yeah, as they say, cars don't kill people; people kill people. Kill people kill people. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so I think and now robotic algorithms would be killing. People. Right. So it will be uh, robotics algorithms that are. Pro, no, it will be robotic algorithms don't kill people. Developers of Develop, robotic oh, algorithms oh. kill people, right? I mean, so. one of the things is people are still in the loop. And at least in the near and midterm, I think people will still be in the loop at some point, even if it's a developer. Like, we're not necessarily at the stage where, you know, robots are programming autonomous robots with different behaviors yeah. quite yet. Um, not it's a scary notion, sorry to interrupt, that a developer is has some responsibility in in the in the death of a human being that's a i mean i think that's burden. why the whole aspect of of ethics in our community is so so important right like because it's true if 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 you think about it um you can basically say i'm not going to work on weaponized ai Right. Like people can say, that's not what I'm going to do. But yet you are programming algorithms that might be used in healthcare al algorithms that might decide whether this person should get this medication or not. And they don't and they die. You, OK, so that is your responsibility. Right. And if you're not conscious and aware that you do have that power when you're coding and, and things like that, I think that's 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 just not a good thing like we need to think about this responsibility as we program robots and and computing devices um, much more than we are yeah so it's not an option to not think about ethics i think it's a majority i would say of computer science sort of there it's kind of a hot topic now i think about bias and so on but it's and we'll talk about it but usually it's kind of you, it's like a very particular group of people that work on that. And then people who do like robotics are like, well, I don't have to think about that. You know, there's other smart people thinking about it. It seems that everybody has to think about it. It's not, you can't escape the ethics, whether it's bias or just every aspect of ethics that has to do with human beings. Everyone. Yeah. So think about, I'm gonna age myself, but I remember uh, when we didn't have like testers, right? And so what did you do? As a developer, you had to test your own code, right? Like you had to go through all the cases and figure it out and, you know, and then they realized that, you know, like we probably need to have testing because we're not getting all the things. And so from there, what happens is like most developers, they do, you know, a little bit of testing, but it's usually like, okay, did my compiler bug out? Yeah. Let me look at the warnings. Okay, is that acceptable or not? Right? Like that's how you typically think about it as a developer and you'll just assume that it's going to go to another process and yeah. they're going to test it out. But I think we need to go back to those early days when, you know, you're a developer, you're developing, there should be like this, a, you know, okay, let me look at the ethical outcomes of this, because there isn't a second, like, testing ethical testers, right? It's you. Mm -hmm. um, we did it back in the early coding days. Um, I think that's where we are with respect to ethics. Like, let's go back to what was good practices, only because we were just developing the field. Yeah, and it's... Uh... I mean, it's a really heavy burden. I've I've had to feel it recently in the last few months, but I think it's a it's a good one to feel. Like I've gotten a message more than one from people. You know, I've unfortunately gotten some attention recently, and I've gotten messages that say that I have blood in my hands because of working on semi autonomous vehicles. So the, the idea that you have semi autonomy means people would become would lose vigilance and so on. That's actually be humans, as we describe. And because of that, because of this idea that we're creating automation, there'll be people be hurt because of it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's you know, there's many nights where I wasn't able to sleep because of this notion. You know, you really do think about people that might die because of this technology. Of course, you can then start rationalizing and saying, well, you know what, 40,000 people die in the United States every year and we're trying to ultimately try to save lives. But the reality is your code you've written 
might kill somebody. And that's an important burden to carry with you as you design the code. I don't even think of it as a burden if we train this concept correctly from the beginning. And I use, and not to say that coding is like being a medical doctor, but think about it. Medical doctors, if they've been in situations where their patient didn't survive, right? Do they give up and go away? No. Every time they come in, they know that there might be a possibility that this patient might not survive. And so when they approach every decision, like that's in their back of their head. And so why isn't that we aren't teaching? And those are tools though, right? They are yeah. given some of the tools to address that so that they don't go crazy. But we don't give those tools so that it does feel like a burden versus something of, I have a great gift and I can do great, awesome good, but with it comes great responsibility. I mean, that's what we teach in terms of, if you think about the medical schools, right? Great gift, great responsibility. I think if we just change the messaging a little, mm -hmm. great gift, being a developer, great responsibility. And this is how you combine those. But do you think, I mean, this is really interesting. I, it's it's outside. I actually have no friends who are sort of surgeons or, or doctors. I mean, what does it feel like to make a mistake in a surgery and somebody to die because of that? Like, is that something you could be taught in medical school, sort of how to be accepting of that risk? So, because I do a lot of uh, work with healthcare robotics, uh, I, I have not lost a patient, for example. Um, the first one's always the hardest, right? But they really teach the value, right? So they teach responsibility, but they also teach the value. Like, you're saving 40000 Mm -hmm. But in order to really feel good about that, when you come to a decision, you have to be able to say at the end, I did all that I could possibly do, right? Versus a, well, I just picked the first widget and did, right? Like, so yeah. every decision is actually thought through. It's not a habit. It's not a, let me just take the best algorithm that my friend gave me, right? It's a, is this it? Is this, this the best? Have I done my best to do good, yeah. right? And so you're right, and uh, I think burden is the wrong word. If it's a, it's a gift, but you have to treat it extremely seriously. Correct. So, so how does Cardano solve the consensus problem? Do you tend to eventually wanting to solve it in the hybrid approach of proof of stake and proof of work? Yeah, this was a philosophical difference between Vitalik and myself. You know, the problem with the people on the Ethereum side is they're really bright. And these really bright people, what they do is they try to do everything all at once because they're really, really smart and they keep going until they run up against the wall and they realize that the problem is a lot harder. If you're more experienced, and that's why we brought in proper academics like Agalos and others, because they've been beaten up through life. You know, the Agalos <laughs> yeah. worked with David Chom and these other, it's really hard work with those guys. And they, they'd already been humiliated and yelled at and had chalk thrown at them and all that stuff. And so they were humble enough to say, I'm not smart enough to solve the big problem. So don't even try. What you do is you decompose it and you say, okay, what's the first problem to solve in a chain of problems that you can compose your way up to a working system? And it, it, once you get far enough along, you have something that's pretty good, and then you have an obvious path forward of how do you iterate and improve that system. That's why we started with GKL15, because it was just saying, we don't know what, what a fucking blockchain is. Mm -hmm. this is. This is, what is this thing, right? What's the security properties of this stuff? Like, what, what do we really mean? Then we did Ouroboros Classic, the original Ouroboros protocol in 2017, and that protocol was like a synchronous system and it assumed the nodes were always on and it worked, but it was useless because that's not real life. Then Prowse came out and then suddenly we relaxed things. These are all, by the way, names for consensus algorithms. Yeah, the, yeah papers that we published and they were all peer reviewed, like GK was EuroCrypt. That's a very hard conference to get into and Orbor's Classic was crypto and Prowse was EuroCrypt and uh, Genesis was CCS. So uh, basically every step of the way was first an academic validation that there was some merit to the work that was done. Second, it solved a particular class of problems, either showing the feasibility of the entire problem. Because when I said, let's do the model first, because let's see if we can do an FLP thing. Let's see if we can get a possibility theorem. That's great, because you're done. It's like, you know, those those short math papers where like, I found a counterexample. It's like, oh, okay, this whole thing is falling apart because you, you have a two line proof, thank you. Uh, so that's what we were looking for in the beginning of the agenda was, let's either prove it's possible in a straw man case or show that there exists an impossibility result, in which case we can just abandon the entire inquiry. Proof of stake is impossible. 
And then once you've gotten past that threshold, it goes from theory to practicality. What actual network conditions are you looking at? Are you okay with living with an external clock or do you want to build time from within? Uh, how are you generating random numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And every step of the way, each paper, you're solving one particular class of problems. With Prism, it said, probably shouldn't know ahead of time who Eve is. Uh, you know, you probably shouldn't know who's making those blocks. That should be something, you know, after the fact. But if you know ahead of time, you can attack them, you can DDoS them, you cause all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, adaptive security. Also, we move from an MPC random number generation, which was great, but very heavy and very slow, and you can't scale to large amounts of people, to a VRF-based system, which is super fast, but a little dirtier. Because Algorand actually did some great work there. There was some good knowledge there. What are the really hard problems that you, maybe if you just linger on a sure. little bit, what are some of the really hard problems you have to solve along this chain of papers, ideas, the evolution of the consensus algorithm? Yeah, it, not only are they really hard problems, they actually require different cryptographers because you're moving from mathematician style cryptographers like the Neil Koblitzes and the Adi Shamirs, you know, the people that like start as proper mathematicians and they really love theory. And that's their thing. And the proofs are dense and they're thick and they're beautiful to practical applied work where you're saying, okay, now this is something an engineer can look at and say, I know how to build that. I know how to think about that. So uh, that transition from GKL to Ouroboros Classic to Prowse, the, 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 I'd say the biggest leap was Classic to Prowse because that was going from a system that would only work in a consortium chain like Fabric Mm -hmm. to a system that would actually work and is working. That's what's implementing Cardano today. You know, $50 billion cryptocurrency and all these people, that was a huge leap. But that paper alone wasn't enough. We also had to layer on the economic model because we said, well, hang on a second here. Not everybody's going to be online all the time to, to be available to make a block. So you need some notion of delegation. The minute you have notion of delegation, you have these stake pools. What the hell does that mean? Uh, and so this is a beautiful kind of interdisciplinary notion that layers computer science and biology together. And minute that complexity starts going up, you start seeing cell specialization. So you go from single cell organisms to organisms where you, you, you know, have eyeballs and brains and hearts, and each of these tissues do different things. Well, analogously, complex distributed systems start getting specialization. You move from the single cell thing, Bitcoin, where everything's a full node, they all have the same rights and responsibilities, a lot of homogeneity in that system, but you're only as good as your weakest link, you're only as, you're only as capable as whatever the basic cell can do, to a specialized system where you start having these actors in the system that are actually a little different than the other actors. So you introduce this concept of the stake pool, and suddenly now you have this actor where you're probably gonna be online 24 seven. You're probably gonna have extra relay infrastructure. There's a, a trust relationship where you don't own the ADA, but you have a right to use it for something. And a person's made that choice to endow you with that. The minute that you introduce specialization though, the system gets more complicated, the game theory gets more complicated. And then you start having to think really deeply and carefully about, okay, well, can this now introduce a new attack vector that we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So that leap from classic to Prowse and adding in stake pools and figuring out how to handle the game theory there was exceedingly hard. It took two years to do that. So stake pools allow so for multiple parties to delegate their staking capabilities to others. Can you describe a little bit how this works? Oh, it's, it's kind of fascinating. It's, it's a super simple concept. So you register a pool and then the pool is there and they're, they're basically they advertise and they're actually registered on chain with a certificate. And then in the wallet software itself, you can see all of the pools that have registered. There's over 3000 of them now inside the system. And then you can click a little tile and it shows you all the metadata that's in the certificate and says, hey, uh, you know, I, I have my own pool. It's called rats, you know, I'm king of the rats. Uh, so you can see all the stuff that's described there and pools have an operating fee because they're like a business. And they say, well, if you delegate to me, uh, I'll charge this much. So if you get like a uh, hundred bucks in rewards, I'll give you, you know, 90 and I'll take 10 or something like that. Uh, and then you make your decision and whichever one you select, you click, you know, delegate, you push the button. And then you have now given your staking rights to them until revoked. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it lives there. And then uh, the stake pool's weight in the system is proportional to the amount of stake that they have delegated to them. And then we have this other limiting factor, K, which says that you get diminishing returns with the more stake you have. So it's kind of like an S function. Mm -hmm. So you kind of go up and up and, up and then eventually caps. And then at some point you get no rewards beyond a certain threshold. So there's an incentive to split pools to different owners after some point. Interesting. Yeah, and so so that's a complex thing and you have to actually model the game theory out to under, 
understand where those parameters should be set. And we didn't know how to do that. So what we did is we we bought talent. We went to Oxford and we hired this guy named Elias Kasupis, who's an algorithmic game theorist. And we said, hey, would you like to do some game theory work in crypto? And he's like, that sounds fun. So he spent a year and a half, we built all these beautiful models and we kind of figured out what those curves needed to look so like. So figure out like the S curve that would result in a nice distribution exactly. of responsibility. So not everybody uh, delegates to the king of the rats. E exactly. How does it feel to be royalty, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a very impressive kingdom, but uh, you're nevertheless a king. I'll take it because I think it's the kindest thing people call me in this space. Oh, uh, yeah. People love you. So, okay. So, that, the, I mean, so, so is that, would you say, a solved problem? The game theory of stake pools? No, it's um, the starting. And then I was getting back to my original point is that you build things in iterations. Every yes. step, if you've done it right, is an invitation for 10 more sexy, fascinating, fun problems. And this is why we have such a great time building labs. You know, we started in Edinburgh. Now we're at Tokyo Tech and University of Wyoming and Athens, and we're setting up more labs this year. And all these academics want to work with us, A, because we write a lot of really fascinating papers, but B, because the, we're focused on all these really cool, sexy, interdisciplinary problems. Mm -hmm. We're actually running the problems where we don't even know where to publish the paper. Because you'll have this paper where there's like these PL guys working with crypto guys, working with systems guys, working with economists. And you put it all together and you have this Frankenstein paper monster. And we're like, where, where do we submit this? You know, where does this go? Nature. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Nature or quanta or something. I don't know. <laughs> It'll write a nice little. So the, the sexy problems multiply exponentially. A exactly. And, you know, and we've now gotten to a point where we're starting to work on refinements to the system rather than fundamental things that are like, if you don't solve it, the system just simply doesn't work. For example, you can run all of this with NTP as your clock server. But you actually can create a notion of time within. We wrote a paper called Warburg's Chronos for that, okay? But uh, that's not necessary for the system. It's just a nice to have thing. It's a nice property. Optimization of the random number generation is another example of that. You can run it with a heavier thing. You just have more blockchain bloat and slower time and transition. We have this concept of epic. So you elect leaders to run the system uh, every five days with Cardano. But there's been derivative work we didn't even do this. This work occurred at University of Illinois. And that derivative work said, well, you don't actually need to do that. You can do it on a block by block basis. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, so that's the other point about doing things in a very rigorous way is that that way is creates a lingua franca for what you're trying to solve with the totality of the academic community. So suddenly people that you've never met, you know nothing about, have read your papers, cited your papers, and start writing their own papers, either to try to attack and destroy things you've done or to build on top of the things that you've done. So people are trying to figure out ways to attack this. Exactly. Rigorous, as, as rigorous as you are trying to- And I don't have 100%. to pay them. That's the beautiful yeah. thing. It's, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun to try to destroy, and that's how we grow stronger. And it's how you build your career too. There's, yeah. there's plenty of people that they've gotten tenure just kicking the hell out of Intel SGX. <laughs> you go to CCS every year, there's some guy there and he's having a hell of a time making Intel cry. <laughs> You've mentioned kind of the, the YouTube algorithm isn't, you know, E equals MC squared. It's not a single equation. It's, it's potentially sort of more than a million lines of code. Sort of, is it more akin to what autonomous, successful autonomous vehicles today are, which is, they're just basically patches on top of patches of heuristics and human experts really tuning the algorithm and have some machine learning modules? Or is it becoming more and more a giant machine learning system with humans just doing a little bit of tweaking here and there? What's your sense? First of all, do you even have a sense of what is the YouTube algorithm at this point? And whichever, however much you do have a sense, what does it look like? Well, we don't, usually think about it as the algorithm um, because it's a bunch of systems that right. work on different services. Uh, the other thing that I think people don't understand is that what you might refer to as the YouTube algorithm from outside of YouTube is actually a, you know, a bunch of code and machine learning systems and heuristics, but that's married with the behavior of all the people who come to YouTube every day. So the people are part of the code, essentially. <laughs> exactly, right? Like if there were no people who came to YouTube tomorrow, then their the algorithm wouldn't work anymore, right. right? So that's a critical part of the algorithm. And so when people talk about, well, the algorithm does this, the algorithm does that, it's sometimes hard to understand. Well, you know, it could be the, the, the viewers are doing that and the algorithm is mostly just keeping track of what the viewers do and then reacting to those things um, 
in in sort of more fine grained situations. And I and I think that this is the way that the recommendation system and the search system and and probably many machine learning systems evolve is you know you start trying to solve a problem and the first way to solve a problem is often with a simple heuristic right and and you know you want to say what are the videos we're going to recommend well how about the most popular ones right and <laughs> that's yeah. where you start right. um and and over time you collect some data and you refine your situation so that you're making less heuristics and you're you're building a system that can actually learn what to do in different situations based on some observations of those situations in the past and uh and you keep chipping away at these heuristics over time and so i think that um just like with diversity uh, you know i think the first diversity uh, measure we took was okay not more than three videos in a row from the same channel right it's a pretty simple heuristic yeah. to encourage diversity but it worked right who needs to see four or five six videos in a row from the same channel um and over time we try to chip away at that and and make it more fine grained and and basically have it remove the heuristics in favor of something that can react to individuals and individual situations so how do you you mentioned you know we we know that something worked how do you get a sense one decision so the kind of a b testing that this idea was a good one this was not so good uh what's how do you measure that and uh, across which time scale across how many users that kind of that kind of thing well you mentioned that a b experiments and so uh just about every single change we make to youtube uh we do it only after we've run a a b experiment mm -hmm. and so in those experiments which run from one week to months, um, we measure hundreds, literally hundreds of different variables and, and measure changes with confidence intervals in all of them. Because we really are trying to get a sense for ultimately, does this improve the experience for viewers? That's the question we're trying to answer. And an experiment is one way um, because we can see certain things go up and down. So for instance, um, if we notice in the experiment, people are dismissing videos less frequently, or they're um, saying that they're more satisfied, they're giving more videos five stars after they watch them, then those would be indications of uh, that the experiment is successful, that it's improving the situation for viewers. Um, but we can also look at other things, like we might do uh, user studies where we invite some people in and ask them like what do you think about this what do you think about that how do you feel about this um and other various kinds of user research but ultimately before we launch something we're going to want to run an experiment so we get a sense for uh what the impact is going to be not just to the viewers but also to the different channels and all of that what we mentioned some of the signals, but what does success look like? What, what does success look like in terms of the algorithm creating a great long-term experience for a user? Or if we put another way, if you look at the videos I've watched this month, how do you know the algorithm succeeded for me? I think, first of all, if you come back and watch more YouTube, then that's one indication that you found some value from it. So just the number of hours is a powerful indicator. Well, I mean, not the hours themselves, but um, uh, the fact that you return on another day. Mm. Um, so that's probably the most simple indicator. Uh, people don't come back to things that they don't find value in, right? There's a lot of other things that they could do. Um, but like I said, I mean, ideally we would like everybody to feel that YouTube enriches their lives and that every video they watched is the best one they've ever watched since they've started watching YouTube. And so that's why uh, we survey them and ask them like, is this one to five stars? And so our version of success is uh, every time someone takes that survey, they say it's five stars. And if we ask them, is this the best video you've ever seen on YouTube? They say yes, every single time. So. Um, it's hard to imagine that we would actually achieve that. Maybe asymptotically we would get there, but uh, but that would be what we think success is. It's funny. I've recently 
said somewhere, I don't know, maybe tweeted, but uh, that uh, Ray Dalio has this video on the the economic machine. I forget what it's called, but it's a 30 minute video. And I said, it's the, the greatest video I've ever watched on YouTube. It's, it's like, I watched the whole thing and my mind was blown is a very crisp, clean des description of how the, at least the American economic system works. It's a beautiful video. And I was just, I wanted to click on something to say this is the best thing. <laughs> this is the best thing ever, please let me, I can't believe I discovered it. Uh, I mean, the, the views and the likes reflect its quality, but I was almost upset that I haven't found it earlier and wanted to find other things like it. I don't think I've ever felt that this is the best video I've ever watched, <laughs> and that was that. And uh, to me, the ultimate utopia, the best experience is where every single video, where I don't see any of the videos I regret, and every single video I watch is one that actually helps me grow, helps me enjoy life, be happy, and so on. Um, well, <laughs> so that's 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 a heck of a, that's a, that's one of the most beautiful and ambitious, I think, machine learning tests. And which reminds me, there's also another signal where users can say, I don't know if it was recently added, but I really enjoy it. It's just saying, I don't, I didn't, something like, I, I don't want to see this video anymore or something like, <laughs> <laughs> like this is a, like there's certain videos that just cut me the wrong way. Like just, just jump out at me. It's like, I don't want to, I don't want this. And it feels really good to clean that up, <laughs> to be like, I don't, that's not that's not for me. I don't know. I, I think that might have been recently added, but that's that's also a really strong signal. Yes, absolutely. Right. We don't want to make a recommendation that uh, people are unhappy with. And that makes me that particular one makes me feel good as a user in general uh, and as a machine learning person because I feel like I'm helping the algorithm. My interactions on YouTube don't always feel like I'm helping the algorithm. Like I'm not reminded of that fact. Uh, like for example. Uh, Tesla and Autopilot and Elon Musk create a feeling for their customers, for people that own Teslas, that they're helping the algorithm of Tesla vehicle. Right. Like they're all like are really proud they're helping right. the fleet learn. I think YouTube doesn't always remind people that you're helping the algorithm get smarter. And for me, I, I love that idea. Like we're all collaboratively, like Wikipedia gives that sense. They're all together creating a, a beautiful thing. YouTube is uh, doesn't always remind me of that. It's, uh, this conversation is reminding me of that, but, uh, <laughs> well, that's a good tip. We should keep that fact in mind when we design these features. I, I'm not sure I, I really thought about it that way, but that's a very interesting perspective. It's an interesting question of personalization that I feel like when I click like on a video, I'm just improving my experience. It would be great, it would make me personally, people are different, but make me feel great if I was helping also the YouTube algorithm broadly say something. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a, that, I don't know if that's human nature, but you want the products you love, and I certainly love YouTube, like you want to help it get smarter and smarter and smarter because there's some kind of coupling between our lives together <laughs> <laughs> being better. If, if YouTube is better then I, will, my life will be better. And that's that kind of reasoning. I'm not sure what that is. And I'm not sure how many people share that feeling. <laughs> that could be just a machine learning feeling. Maybe the basics of the quote unquote YouTube algorithm. What does the YouTube algorithm look at to make recommendation for what to watch next from, from a machine learning perspective? Or when you search for a particular term, how does it know what to show you next? Because it seems to, at least for me, do an incredible job of both. <laughs> Well, that's kind of you to say. It didn't used to do a very good job, <laughs> um, but it's gotten better over the years. Uh, even even I observed that it's improved quite a bit. Um, those are two different situations. Like when you search for something, uh, YouTube uses the best technology we can get from Google um, to make sure that that the YouTube search system finds what someone's looking for. And of course, the very first things that one thinks about is, okay, well, does the word occur in the title, mm -hmm. for instance? Um, uh, you know, but there, but there are much more sophisticated things um, where we're mostly trying to do some syntactic match or, or maybe a semantic match based on uh, words that we can add um, to the document itself. For instance, uh, you know, maybe is is this video uh watched a lot after this query 
right? That's something that uh, we can observe. And then as a result, uh, make sure that that, that uh, document would be retrieved for that query. Um, now, when you talk about what kind of videos would be recommended to watch next, um, that's something, again, we've been working on for many years. And probably the first um, the first real attempt to do that well was to use collaborative filtering. So you can you describe what collaborative filtering is? Sure. It's just um, basically what we do is we observe which videos get watched close together by the same person. And if you observe that, and if you can imagine creating a graph where the videos that get watched close together by the most people are sort of very close to one another in this graph and videos that don't frequently get watched close to close together by the same person or, or the same people are far apart, then you end up with this um, gr graph that we call the related graph that basically represents videos that are very similar or related in some way. And what's amazing about that is that uh, it puts all the videos that are in the same language together, for instance. Mm. And we didn't even have to think about language. It yeah. just does it, yeah. right? And it puts all the videos that are about sports together, and it puts most of the music videos together, and it puts all of these sorts of videos together um, just because that's sort of the way the people using YouTube behave. So that already cleans up a lot of the problem it, it it takes care of the lowest hanging fruit, which is, happens to be a huge one of just managing these millions of videos. That's right. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was talking to someone who was um, uh, trying to propose that we do a, a research project concerning people who um, who are bilingual. And this person was uh, making this proposal based on the idea that YouTube could not possibly be good at recommending videos well to people who are bilingual. And so um, she was telling me uh, about this and I said, well, can you give me an example of what problem do you think we have on YouTube with the recommendations? And so she said, well, I'm a, um, a researcher in, in the US and, and when I'm looking for academic topics, I want to look, I want to see them in English. And so she searched for one, found a video, and then looked at the watch next suggestions, and they were all in English. Mm -hmm. And so she said, oh, I see. YouTube must think that I speak only English. And so she said, now, I'm actually originally from Turkey, and sometimes when I'm cooking, let's say I want to make some baklava, I really like to watch videos that are in Turkish. And so she searched for a video about making the baklava and then and then selected it, and it was in Turkish, and the watch next recommendations were in Turkish. And she just couldn't believe how this was possible. And, and how is it that you know that I speak both these two languages and put all the videos together? And it's just as a, a, a sort of an outcome of this related graph that's created through collaborative filtering. So for me, one of my huge interests is just human psychology, right? And, and that's such a powerful platform on which to utilize human psychology to, to discover what people, individual people want to watch next. But it's also be just fascinating to me you know, I've uh, Google search has ability to look at your own history. And I've done that before, just, just what I've searched three years, for many, many years. And it's a fascinating picture of who I am, actually. And um, I don't think anyone's ever summarized. I personally would love that a summary of who I am as a person on the internet to me, <laughs> because I think it reveals, I, I think it puts a mirror to me or to others, you know, that's actually quite revealing and interesting. You know, uh, just uh, maybe the number of, it's, it's a joke, but not really is the number of cat videos I've watched <laughs> or videos of people falling, you know, stuff that's absurd, um, th that kind of stuff. It's really interesting. And of course, it's really good for the machine learning aspect to, uh, to, to, to show, uh, to figure out what to show next, but it's interesting. Um, Hey, have you just as a tangent played around with the idea of giving a map to people sort of as opposed to just using this information to show what's next, showing them 
here are the clusters you've loved over the years kind of thing. Well, we do provide the history of all the videos that you've watched. Yes. So you can definitely search through that and, and look through it and search through it to see what it is that you've been watching on YouTube. Uh, we have actually, in various times, um, experimented with this sort of cluster idea, finding ways to demonstrate or show people um, what topics they've been interested in or what, what clusters they've watched from. It's interesting that you bring this up because um, in some sense, the, the way the recommendation system of YouTube sees a user is exactly as the history of all the videos they've watched on YouTube. And so you can think of um, yourself or, or, or any user on YouTube as kind of like a, a DNA <laughs> strand, strand yeah. of all your videos, right? Um, that sort of represents you uh, you can also think of it as maybe a vector in the space of all the videos on YouTube. And so, you know, now once you think of it as a vector in the space of all the videos on YouTube, then you can start to say, okay, well, you know, which videos, which which other vectors are close to me and uh, to my vector? And, um, and that's one of the ways that we generate some diverse recommendations is because yeah. you're like, okay, well, you know, these... These people seem to be close with respect to the videos they've watched on YouTube, but you know, here's a topic or a video that one of them has watched and enjoyed, but the other one hasn't. That could be an opportunity uh, to make a good recommendation. I gotta tell you, I mean, I know I'm, I'm gonna ask for things that are impossible, but I would love to cluster than human beings. Like I would love to know who has similar trajectories as me, because you probably <laughs> would wanna hang out, right? There's a social aspect there. Like actually finding some of the most fascinating people I find on YouTube have like no followers and I start following them and they create incredible content. And, you know, and on that topic, I just love to ask, there's some videos that just blow my mind in terms of quality and depth and just in every regard are amazing videos and they have like 57 views. Okay, how do you get a videos of quality to be seen by many eyes. So the measure of quality, is it just something, yeah, how, how do you know that something is good? Well, I mean, I think it depends initially on what sort of video we're talking about. So um, in the realm of, let's say, you, you mentioned politics and news, yes. in that realm, um, you know, quality news or quality journalism relies on having a journalism uh, department, right? Like you, you you have to have actual journalists and fact checkers and people like that. Um, and so in that situation and in others, maybe science or in medicine, um, quality has a lot to do with the authoritativeness and the credibility and the expertise of the people who make the video. Now, if you think about the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, what is the highest quality prank video? Or what is the highest quality um, right. Minecraft video? Yeah, right. Uh, that might be the one that people enjoy watching the most and watch to the end. Or it might be um, the one that, uh, when we ask people the next day after they watched it, were they satisfied with it? And so we, in in especially in the realm of entertainment. Um, have been trying to get at better and better measures of quality or satisfaction or enrichment since I came to YouTube. And, and we started with, well, you know, the first approximation is the one that gets more views. But, um, but you know, we, we both know that things can get a lot of views and not really be that high quality, uh, especially if people are clicking on something and then immediately realizing that it's not that great in abandoning it. Um, and that's why we moved from views to thinking about the amount of time people spend watching it with the premise that like, you know, in some sense, the time that someone spends watching a video is related to the value that they get from that video. It may not be perfectly related, but it has something to say about how much value they get. Um, but even that's not good enough, right? Because, uh, I myself have spent time clicking through channels on television late at night and ended up watching Under Siege 2 for some reason I don't know. And if you were to ask me the next day, are you glad that you watched that show on 
TV last night, I'd say, yeah, I wish I would have gone to bed or read a book or almost anything else, really. Yeah. Um, and so that's why uh, some people got the idea a few years ago to try to survey users afterwards. And so, um, so we get feedback data from those surveys and then use that in the machine learning system to try to not just predict what you're going to click on right now, what you might watch for a while, but what when we ask you tomorrow, you'll give four or five stars to. So just to summarize, what are the signals from a machine learning perspective that a user can provide? So you mentioned just clicking on the video views, the time watched, maybe the relative time watched, the, uh, the clicking like and dislike on the video, maybe commenting on the video. And all of those things. All of those things. And yes. then the, the one I wasn't actually quite aware of, even though I might have engaged in it, is uh, a survey afterwards, which is a brilliant idea. Is there other signals? Are, I mean, that's already a really rich space of signals to learn from. Is there something else? That well, you mentioned commenting, also sharing the video. If you if you think it's worthy to be shared with someone else you know. Within YouTube or outside of YouTube as well? Either. Either. Let's see, you mentioned like, dislike. Yeah, like and dislike, how important is that? Uh, it's very important, right? We want it, it's predictive of satisfaction, uh, but it's not it's not perfectly predictive. Um, subscribe if you subscribe to the channel of the person who made the video, then that also is a piece of information and it signals um, satisfaction. Although over the years we've learned that people have a wide range of attitudes about what it means to subscribe. Right. Um, we would ask some users who didn't subscribe very much, why, but they watched a lot from a few channels. We'd say, well, why didn't you subscribe? And they would say, well, I, I can't afford to pay for anything. <laughs> um, and you know, we tried to let them understand, like, actually, it doesn't cost anything. It's free. It just helps us know that you are very interested in this creator. Um, but then we've asked other people who subscribe to many things and, and don't really watch any of the videos from those channels. And we say, well, well, why did you subscribe to this if you weren't really interested in any more videos from that channel? And they might tell us, um, well, I just, you know, I thought the person did a great job and I just want to kind of give them a high five. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so. Yeah, that's where I, I said, I actually subscribe to channels where I just, this person is amazing. I, I like this person, but then uh, I like this person. I really want to support them. Uh, that that's how I click subscribe. Right. E even though I mean, never actually want to click on their videos when they're <laughs> releasing it. I just love what they're doing, and it's maybe outside of my interest area, uh, and so on, which is probably the wrong way to use the subscribe button. But I just want to say, congrats! This is great work. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I you mean, have to deal with all the space of people that see the subscribe it, button is totally different. That's thing. right, and so you know, we we can't just close our eyes and say, sorry, you're using it wrong. You know, it, we're, we're not going to pay attention to what you've done. Um, we need to embrace all the ways in which all the different like people in the world use the subscribe button or the like and the dislike button. So in terms of signals of machine learning, you know, so one of the first applications uh, that we showed in the paper was to crack uh, text-based captchas. What are captures, by the way? Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> by the way, one of the most awesome, like I, the people don't use this term anymore. It's human computation, I think. Uh, I love this term. The guy who created captures, I think, came up with this term. Yeah, I love it. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what what are captures? So captures are those strings that you fill in uh, when you're, you know, when if you're open, opening a new account in Google. They show you a picture, a, you know, usually it used to be a set of garbled letters uh, that you have to kind of uh, figure out what 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 is that string of characters and type in. Mm -hmm. And the reason CAPTCHAs exist is because, you know, um, Google or Twitter do not want automatic creation of accounts. You can use a computer to create millions of accounts uh, and uh, use that for in nefarious purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to make sure that to the extent possible, the interaction that you know, their system is having is with a human. So it's a it's called a human interaction proof. A CAPTCHA mm -hmm. is a human interaction proof. Yeah. Um, so, so this is, a CAPTCHAs are by design things that are easy for humans to solve, 
but hard for computers. Hard for robots, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and text-based CAPTCHAs were, was the one which was prevalent until around 2014. Because at that time, text-based CAPTCHAs were hard for computers to crack. Even now, they are actually, in the sense of an arbitrary text-based CAPTCHA will be unsolvable even now. But with the techniques that we have developed, it can be, you know, you can quickly develop a mechanism that solves uh, the CAPTCHA. Uh, well, they, they've probably gotten a lot harder, too. The people, they, 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 they've been getting clever and clever at generating these text CAPTCHAs. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Right. So, okay, so that was one of the things you've tested it on is these kinds of CAPTCHAs in yeah. 2014, 15, Correct. that kind of stuff. Right, right. So what, uh, what I mean, why, by the way, why CAPTCHAs? Why? Yeah, yeah. Even now, I would say CAPTCHA is a very, very good challenge problem uh, if you want to understand how human perception works and if you want to build uh, systems that work like the human brain. Uh, and I wouldn't say CAPTCHA is a solved problem. We have cracked the fundamental defense of CAPTCHAs, but it is not solved in the way that humans solve it. Um, so I can give an example. I can um, take a five-year-old child who has just learned characters uh, and... Uh, show them any new capture that we create, mm -hmm. they will be able to solve it. Uh, I can show you pretty much any new capture uh, from any new website. You'll be able to solve it without getting any training examples from that particular style of yeah. capture. You're assuming I'm human, yeah. Yes, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's right. <laughs> so if you are human, I, yeah. if you, otherwise I will be able to figure that out <laughs> yeah. well, using this one. <laughs> but uh, this, this whole podcast is just a Turing test, that's a, long, right. a long Turing test. Anyway, I'm sorry. So yeah, uh, so excuse, human humans can figure it out with very few examples. Or no training examples, no like training. no training examples from that particular style of capture. Yeah. Um, and, and so you can, you know, so, uh, even now, this is unreachable for uh, the current deep learning system. So basically, there is no, I, I don't think a system exists where you can basically say, train on whatever you want. And then now say, hey, I will show you a new CAPTCHA, which I did not show you in, in, the, in the training setup. Will the system be able to solve it? Um, it still doesn't exist. So that is the magic of human perception. Yeah. And Doug Hofstadter uh, put this uh, very beautifully in uh, one of his uh, talks. The, the central problem in AI is what is the letter A? Mm -hmm. if, you can, if you can build a system that reliably can detect all the variations of the letter A, you don't even need to go to the... <laughs> the, <laughs> the B and the C. Yeah. yeah, you don't even need to go to the B and the C or the strings of characters. And... Uh, so that that is the spirit at which you know with which we uh, tackle that problem. Well, what does it mean by that? I mean, is is it uh, like without training examples, try to figure out the fundamental uh, elements that make up the letter A in all of its forms? In all of its forms, it can be A can be made with two humans standing, leaning against each other, holding the hands, yeah. uh, and. Uh, it can be made of leaves. It can be. Yeah, you might have to understand uh, everything about this world in order to understand the letter A. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, so it's common sense reasoning right, essentially. Right, yeah, right. So, so to finally, to really solve, finally, we, to say that we have solved CAPTCHA, uh, you have to solve the whole problem. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, what? How does uh, this kind of the RCN architecture help us to get uh, do a better job of that kind of yeah. thing? Yeah. So. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the important things was being able to do inference, being able to dynamically do inference. Uh, can you can you uh, can, can you uh, clarify what you mean? Because you said like neural networks don't do inference. Yeah. So what do you mean by inference in this context then? So okay, so in captures, what they do to confuse people is to make these characters crowd together. Yes. Okay. And when you make the characters crowd together, what happens is that you will now start seeing combinations of characters as some other new character mm -hmm. or or an existing character so you would you would put an r and n together it will start looking like an m mm -hmm. uh, and and so locally they are, you know th th there is very strong evidence for it being uh, some uh, incorrect character but globally the only explanation that fits together is something that is different from what you can find locally yes so th so th so this is uh, inference. You are basically taking uh, local evidence and putting it in the global context and often coming to a conclusion locally, which is 
conflicting with the local information. So actually, so you mean inference like uh, in the way it's used to, when you talk about reasoning, for example, uh, as opposed to like inference, which is a, with, neural, with artificial neural networks, which is a single pass to the network. Correct. Okay. Got it. So like you, you're basically doing some basic forms of reasoning, Got it. like integration of like uh, how local things fit into the the global right. picture, and, and and things like explaining away coming into this one because you are you are uh, explaining that piece of evidence uh, as something else uh, because globally that's the only thing that makes sense. Um, yeah. So now uh, you can amortize this inference by you know in a neural network. If you want to do this, what you, you can you can brute force it. You can just show it all combinations of things uh, yeah. that you want to you want to uh, your reasoning to work over, mm -hmm. and you can you know like just train the hell out of that neural network, and it will look like it is doing uh, you know inference on the fly, but it is it is really just doing amortized inference. It is because you you have shown it a lot of these combinations during training time. Mm -hmm. um, so what you want to do is be able to do dynamic inference rather than just being able to show all those combinations in the training time. And that's something we emphasized in the model. What does it mean dynamic inference? Is that, that has to do with the feedback thing? Yes. Like what, what is dynamic? I mean, I, I'm trying to visualize what dynamic inference would be in this case. Like what is it doing with the input? It's shown the input the first time. And yeah. And is, is like what's changing over temporally over to, what's the dynamics of this inference process? So, so you can think of it as you have um, at the top of the model the characters that you are trained on. Yeah. They are the causes. They, you are trying to explain the pixels mm -hmm. using the characters as the causes. The you know the characters are the things that cause the pixels. Yeah. So there's this causality thing. So the reason you mentioned causality, I guess, is because there's a temporal aspect to this whole thing. In this particular case, the temporal aspect is not important. It is more like when, if if I turn the character on, the the pixels will turn on. Uh, yeah, it will be after this a little bit, but okay. Yeah. So that is the causality in the sense of like a logic causality, like hence inference. Okay. Right. Right. The dynamics is that uh, even though locally, it will look like okay, this is an A, mm -hmm. uh, and and locally, just when I look at just that patch of the image. It looks like an A, mm -hmm. but when I look at it in the context of all the other causes, it might not. You know, A is not the something that makes sense. So that is something you have to kind of you know recursively figure out. Yeah. Uh, so okay. So uh, and uh, this thing performed pretty well on the captures. Correct. And uh, I mean, is there some kind of interesting intuition you can provide why it did well? Like. What did it look like? Is there visualizations that could be human interpretable to us humans? Yes. Yeah. So the, the good thing about the model is that it is extremely um, so it is not just doing a classification, right? It is, it is, it is, it is providing a full explanation for the scene. So when when it when it um operates on a scene, it is coming at back and saying, look, this is the part is the A, and these are the pixels that turned on uh these are the pixels in the input that tells makes me think that it is an A, mm -hmm. and also these are the portions I hallucinated. It, it, you know, it, it it provides a complete explanation of that form, and, and then it's gonna, so these are the contours. These are this is the interior, and this is in front of this other object. So th that that's the kind of um, explanation it um, the the inference network provides. So so that that is useful and interpretable. Um, and uh, um, then the kind of errors it makes are also, I don't want to um, read too much into it, but the kind of errors the network makes are uh, very similar to the kinds of errors humans would make in a, in a similar situation. So there's something about the structure that uh, feels reminiscent of the way humans' uh, visual right. system works. Well, I mean, uh, how hard coded is this to the capture problem? This idea, uh, not really hard coded, because it's the uh, the assumptions, as I mentioned, are general, right? It is more, um, and and those themselves can be applied in many situations, which are natural signals. Um, so it's it's the foreground versus uh, background factorization, and uh, the factorization of the surfaces versus the contours. 
So these are all generally applicable assumptions. In, in our vision. Yeah. So why, why capture, why attack the capture problem, which is quite unique in the computer vision context versus like the traditional benchmarks of ImageNet and all those kinds of image classification or even segmentation tests, all that kind of stuff. Do you feel like that's, uh, I mean, what what's your thinking about those kinds of benchmarks in um, in this in this context? I mean, those benchmarks are useful for deep learning kind of algorithms where you, you know, so the, the settings uh, that deep learning works in are, here is my huge training set and here is my test set. So the, mm -hmm. the, the training set is almost, uh, you know, 100x, 1000x bigger than uh, the test set in many, many cases. Uh, what we wanted to do was invert that. The, the training set is way smaller than the, the test set. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, and you know uh, capture is a problem that is by definition hard for computers and it has these good properties of strong generalization strong out of training distribution generalization if you are interested in studying that uh, and putting uh, having your model have that property then it's a, it's a good data set to tackle so is there have you attempted to which i think i believe there's quite a growing body of work on looking at mnist and imagenet without training so like taking like the basic challenge is how what tiny fraction of the training set can we take in order to do a reasonable job of the right. classification task have right. have you explored that angle on these Classic benchmarks. Yes, so so we did do MNIST. So um, you know, so it's not just CAPTCHA. We mm -hmm. uh, so there was uh, also uh, 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 versions of multiple versions of MNIST, including the the standard version, which where we inverted the problem, which is basically saying rather than train on sixty thousand uh, training data, uh, you know, how uh, quickly can you get uh, to high level accuracy with very little training data? Was is there some uh, performance you remember, like how well? How well did it do? How many examples did it need? Yeah, I, I, I like, you know, I remember that it was, you know, uh, on the order of uh, tens or hundreds of examples to get into uh, ninety-five percent accuracy, and it was, it was definitely better than the systems, other systems out there at that time. At that time, yeah, yeah, they're really pushing. That. I think that's a really interesting space, actually. Uh, I think there's an actual name for MNIST that uh, like there's different names to the different sizes of training sets. I mean, people are like attacking this problem. I think it's yeah. super interesting. Yeah, It's funny how like the MNIST will probably be with us all the way to AGI. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a data set that just sticks by. It, it is, it's a clean, simple uh, data set to, uh, to study the fundamentals of learning with. Just like captures, it's interesting. It. Not enough people I don't know, maybe you can correct me, but I feel like captures don't show up as often in papers as they probably should. That's correct, yeah. Because, you know, um, usually these things have a momentum. Uh, you know, once once uh, something gets established as a standard benchmark, yeah. there, is a, there, is a, uh, there is a dynamics of uh, how graduate students operate and how uh, academ academic system works that uh, pushes people to track that uh, benchmark. So. Yeah. To folk. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> nobody wants to think outside the box. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So good performance on the captures. What else is there interesting um, on the RCN side before we talk about the cortical microscope? Yeah. So the the same model. So the, the 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 important part of the model was that it trains very quickly with very little training data, and it's uh, you know quite robust to out of distribution uh, perturbations. Um, and uh, and we are using that uh, very uh, fruitfully in uh, at Vicarious in many of the robotics tasks we are solving. Are you by any chance uh, aware of uh, the Hutter Prize, Marcus Hutter? He uh, he made this prize for compression of Wikipedia pages, and uh, there's a few qualities to it. One I think has to be perfect compression, which makes I think that little quirk makes it much less um, applicable to the general task of intelligence because it feels like intelligence is always going to be messy. Uh, like perfect compression is feels like it's not the right goal. 
but it's nevertheless a very interesting goal. So for him, intelligence equals compression. And so the smaller you make the file, given a large Wikipedia page, the more intelligent the system has to be. Yeah, that makes sense. So you can make perfect compression if you store errors. And I think that actually what he meant is you have algorithm plus errors. Uh, by the way, Hutter, Hutter is a, he was a PhD advisor of Xian Lek, who is a deep mm -hmm. mind, uh, uh, deep mind co-founder. Yeah. Yeah. So there's an interesting, uh, and now he's a deep mind. There's an interesting, uh, network of people. He's one of the people that I think seriously took on the task of what would an AGI system look like? I think for the longest time, the, the question of AGI was not taken seriously or rather rigorously. And he, he did just that. Like mathematically speaking, what would the model look like? If you remove the constraints of it having to be, uh, um, having to have a uh, reasonable amount of memory, reasonable amount of uh, running time complexity, uh, computation time, what would it look like? And essentially it's, it's a half math, half philosophical discussion of uh, how would it, like a reinforcement learning type of uh, framework look like for an AGI. Yeah, so he developed the framework even to describe what's optimal with respect to reinforcement learning. Like there is a theoretical framework, which is, as you said, uh, under assumption, there is infinite amount of memory and compute. And mm -hmm. um, there was actually one person before his name is Solomonov. Kuter extended uh, Solomonov work to reinforcement learning, but there exists a, a theoretical algorithm, which is optimal algorithm to build intelligence. And I can actually explain you the algorithm. Yes, let's go, <laughs> let's, go. let's go. So the task itself, you can- C Can I just pause how absurd it is for brain in a skull trying to explain the algorithm for intelligence. Just go ahead. It is pretty crazy. It is pretty crazy that, you know, the brain itself is actually so small and it can ponder. Uh, <laughs> How to design algorithms that optimally solve the problem of intelligence. Okay. All right, so what's the algorithm? Solve? So let's see. So first of all, the task itself is uh, described as uh, you have infinite sequence of zeros and ones, okay? you read uh, n bits and you are about to predict n plus one bit. Mm -hmm. So that's the task. And you could imagine that every task could be casted as such a task. So if for instance, you have images and labels, you can just turn every image into a sequence of zeros and ones, then label, you concatenate labels and you and that that's actually the, the and you could, you could start by having training data first and then afterwards you have test data. So theoretically any problem could be casted as a problem of predicting zeros and ones on this uh, infinite tape. So, mm -hmm. um, so let's say you read already n bits and you want to predict n plus one bit. And I will ask you to write every possible program that generates these n bits. Okay, so, um, and you can have, you, you, you choose programming language. It can be in Python or C++. And the difference between programming languages uh, might be, there is a difference by constant, uh, asymptotically, your predictions will be equivalent. Mm -hmm. So you, you read n bits, you enumerate all the programs that produce these n, n bits in their output. Mm -hmm. And then in order to predict n plus one bit, you actually weight the programs according to their length. And uh, there is like a, some specific formula how you weight them. And then the n plus uh, one bit prediction is the prediction uh, from each of this program according to the weight. Like statistically. You statistically, pick, you yeah. Pick, so the smaller the program, the more likely you you are to pick the its output. So uh, that's that algorithm is grounded in the hope or the intuition that the simple answer is the right one. It, it's a formalization of it. Yeah. Um, it also means like if you would ask the question after how many years would, you know, sun explode, mm -hmm. uh, you can say, hmm, it's more likely the answer is two to, to some power because it's a shorter program. Yeah. Um, than other. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't have a good intuition about uh, how different the space of short programs are from the space of large programs. Like 
what is the universe where short programs uh, like run things? <laughs> uh, so as I said, the things have to agree with end bits. So even if you have, sh you, you you need to start like a, if if you have very short program and they're like a, still some has it, if it's not perfect with prediction of end bits, you have to start errors. What are the errors? And that gives you the full program that agrees on end bits. Oh, so you don't agree perfectly with the, the end bits and you store. The That's like a longer, a longer program, slightly longer program, because it contains these extra bits of errors. That's fascinating. What's what's your intuition about the the programs that are able to do cool stuff like intelligence and consciousness? Are they uh, perfectly like? Is is it? Uh, is there if then statements in them? So like, is there a lot of exceptions that they're storing? So. Um, you could imagine if there would be tremendous amount of if statements, yeah. then they wouldn't be that short. In case of neural networks, you could imagine that the, what happens is uh, they, uh, when you start with an uninitialized neural network, uh, it stores internally many possibilities how the uh, how the problem can be solved, and SGD is kind of magnifying some some uh, some uh, paths which are slightly similar to the correct answer. So it's kind of magnifying correct programs. And in some sense, HDD is a search algorithm in the program space. And the program space is represented by, uh, you know, kind of the wiring inside of the neural network. And there's like an insane number of ways how the features can be computed. What's your view on how to best distribute effort? So there's three, I would say, technical aspects of autopilot that are really important. So it's the underlying algorithms, like the neural network architecture, there's the data, so that it's trained on, and then there's the hardware development. There may be others, but so look, algorithm, data, hardware, you, you only have so much money, only have so much time. What do you think is the most important thing to, to uh, allocate resources to? Or do you see it as pretty evenly distributed between those three? We automatically get a vast amounts of data because all of our cars have eight external facing cameras and radar and usually 12 ultrasonic sensors, uh, GPS, obviously, um, and uh, IMU. And so we, we basically have a fleet that has, uh, and we've got about 400,000 cars on the road that have that level of data. Actually, I think you keep quite close track of it, actually. Yes. Yeah, so we're we're approaching half a million cars on the road that have the full sensor suite. Yeah. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm not sure how many other cars on the road have this sensor suite, but I'd be surprised if it's more than 5,000, which means that we have 99% we have of all the data. So there's this huge um, inflow of data. Absolutely, massive inflow of data. And then we it's, it's taken us about three years, but now we've finally developed our full self-driving computer, which can process uh, an, an order of magnitude as much as the NVIDIA system that we currently have in the, in the cars. And it's really just a, to use it, you unplug the NVIDIA computer and plug the Tesla computer in, and that's it. And it's, it's a, in fact, we're not even, we're still exploring the boundaries of its capabilities. Uh, we're able to run the cameras at full frame rate, full resolution, uh, not even crop the images. And uh, it's still got headroom, even on one of the, the systems. So the hard, full, full self-driving computer is really two computers, two systems on a chip that are fully redundant. So you could put a bolt through basically any part of that system and it still works. The redundancy, are they perfect copies of each other? Or yeah. also it's, purely for redundancy as opposed to an argue machine kind of architecture where they're both making decisions. This is purely for redundancy. I think more like it's, if you have a, a twin engine aircraft, a mm. commercial aircraft, the system will operate best if both systems are operating, but it's, it's capable of operating safely on one. So, but as it is right now, we can just run, we're, we haven't even hit the, 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 ed, the edge of performance. So, there's no need to actually distribute functionality across both SOCs. We we can actually just run a full duplicate on on, on each one. So you haven't really explored or hit the limit of this. No, not yet. Hit the limit now. So you know, 
the challenges this world presents will create divisions, will create chaos and so on. So I'm more focused on the way we deal as a society with that chaos, the way we talk to each other. That's huge. The c- that's creating huge. the platform that's healthy for that. Now, as a, as a comedian, creator, whatever you want to call it, people that put out content, uh, the gatekeepers are now algorithmic, right? So they are kind of almost AI already. So if you are a person that puts out, you know, YouTube videos, podcasts, uh, whatever you're doing, um, you are, it used to be a guy in the back of the room with a cigar saying, I like you or get him out of here. Now it's, it's an algorithm you barely understand. Like I talk, I talk to people at YouTube, but I don't know if they understand right. the algorithm. They don't. They don't. This and that's is fascinating. Crazy. Yeah. It's fascinating. Cause I, I speak to people at YouTube and I go, Hey man, what's going on here? One of my episode titles of my podcast was called knife fight in Malibu. It was about real estate. And and it was because a realtor in Malibu. I was trying to get a summer rental, which I can't really afford. But yeah. I, I don't I don't think that's a huge problem. I I you know I follow my dreams. <laughs> so I called a realtor, and she said, "Listen." She goes, "I don't know what the government's saying." Yeah. But she goes, "It's a real knife fight out here." You know, an old grizzled woman, real realtor, yeah. tan skin, cig out the mouth, yeah, yeah. driving a Porsche. You know, yeah. it's a real knife fight out here. You know, her <laughs> entire life had become real estate. Her soul had been hollowed out. Her kids yeah. hate her. Yeah. You know, no one's made her come in years, but it's just, she just loves heated She's kitchen fun, floors and views. Fun. Yeah. She's a demon from hell and we yeah. need them. <laughs> yeah. Truly. Yeah. We're getting rid of them. It's not good. Yeah. And she goes, it's a real knife fight out here. So we put that in the episode title. And of course, I guess some algorithm thought that we were showing like people stabbing each other in a Wendy's and <laughs> we, we got like demonetized. Did we get demonetized? We didn't get demonetized, but we lost it. We lost a lot of views because we were kicked out of whatever out, like we were just kicked out. Yeah. And then I was asking YouTube about it. They, they were kind of understanding it, but even the people that worked there didn't truly seem to understand the algorithm. So can you explain to me how that works where they barely know what's going on? No, they do not understand the full dynamics of the, the monster or the amazing thing that they've created. It's the amount of content that's being created is larger than anyone understands. Right. Like this is huge. They can't deal with it. The teams aren't large enough to deal with it. There's like special cases. So if you fall into the category of special cases, we can maybe talk about that, like a Donald Trump, where you like actually have meetings about what to do with this particular account. But everything outside of that is all algorithms. They get uh, reported by people and they get, uh, like if enough people report a particular video, a particular tweet, it get it rises up to where humans look over it. But the, the, re- the initial step of the reporting and the rising up to the human supervision is done by algorithm and they don't understand the dynamics of that because we're talking about billions of tweets. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of hours of video uploaded every day. Now, the hilarity of it is that most of the YouTube algorithm is based on the title. (laughs) <laughs> That's crazy. It's and the description is a small contribution in terms of filtering, in terters of the knife fight situation. Right. And that that's all they can do. They cannot they don't have algorithms at all that are able to process the content of the video. So they try to also infer information based on if you're watching all of these like Q and videos or something like that or flat Earth videos, and you also watch are really excitedly watching the whole knife fight in uh, Malibu right. video that says that increases the chance that the knife fight uh, is a, a, a dangerous video for society or something like interesting. that. Interesting. Wow. Based on their so contribution. People are watching something because I watch QAnon and flat earth videos to ridicule them. Right. That, you know what I mean? I watch these videos and I make fun of them on my show. Yeah. But what's interesting is if I then go watch something else, I'm increasing the likelihood that that video is going to get looked at as potentially subversive right. or dangerous. Exactly. That's why. So they make decisions about who you are, but who you are as a human being, as a yeah. watcher, individual user, based on the clusters of videos you're in. But those clusters are not manually determined. They're they're automatically clustered. It's and- so weird. I, we have titles where they got upset about it and it, I don't even understand. Yeah. Like we had a title that was so innocuous, in my opinion, and the title of the episode was called Bomb Disney World. And I was asking people to consider bombing Disney World. Mm-hmm. And YouTube got angry at that. 
So you don't know why. You can never understand why. You could why. have said Disney World is the bombs. Right, right, right. It's, it's just I rearranging. Just, That's what I wasn't probably saying meant. to do it, but I was saying let's start thinking about yeah. plans to do like not let's do it like but let's well, let's get in the mind let's change the conversation yeah i think it's very interesting because as a comedian you don't want to live in that world of worrying about algorithms you don't want to worry about deplatforming and shadow banning i mean all these conversations that i've had with other comedians about shadow banning i mean it's hilarious we all call each other i think i'm being shadow banned are you being shadow banned and nobody knew what that word was a, a month ago i mean a, a year ago but everyone now is convinced that everything they do that isn't succeeding is being shadow banned. Yeah. <laughs> so it's this new paranoia, Yeah. this algorithmic paranoia now that we all kind of have because there are genuine instances of people being taken out of an algorithm, you know, rightly or wrongly, for whatever, however you want to believe. But then there are also things that just don't perform as well for a myriad of reasons. And, and then we're all saying like, well, they're against me. They're shutting me down, and you don't know if that's true or not. Well, uh, first of all, what is a polynomial time algorithm? Yeah, perhaps we could discuss that. So, uh, yeah, let's let's actually just even yeah, that's what is algorithmic uh, algorithmic complexity? What are the major classes of algorithm complexity? So we in the, in a problem like the assignment problem or um, scheduling schools or any of these applications. Um, you have a set of input data, which might, for example, be um, um, uh, a set of vertices connected by edges with the, you're given for each edge the capacity of the edge. And um, you have um, algorithms which are, uh, think of them as computer pr programs with operations such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, comparison of numbers, and so on. Um, and you're trying to construct an algorithm uh, based on those operations, which will determine in, in a minimum number of computational steps the answer to the problem. In this case, the computational step is one of those operations. And the answer to the problem is, let's say, the um, the configuration of the network that carries the maximum amount of flow. And an algorithm is said to run in polynomial time if, as a function of the size of the input, the number of vertices, the number of edges, and so on, um, the number of basic computational steps grows only as some fixed power of that size. A linear algorithm would execute a number of steps linearly proportional to the size. Quadratic algorithm would be steps proportional to the square of the size and so on. And algorithms that whose running time is bounded by some fixed power of the size are called polynomial algorithms. And, and that's supposed to be relatively fast class of algorithms. That's right. We theoreticians take that to be the definition of an algorithm being um, efficient and uh, and we're interested in which problems can be solved by such efficient algorithms. One can argue whether that's the right definition of efficient because you could have an algorithm whose running time is the 10,000th power of the size of the input, and that wouldn't be really efficient. But in, And in practice, it's oftentimes reducing from an n squared algorithm to an n log n or a linear time is practically the jump that you want to make to allow a real world system to solve a problem. Yeah, that's so, also true because especially as we get very large networks, the size can be in the millions and uh, and then uh, anything above uh, n log n, where n is the size, would be uh, too much for uh, practical solution. Okay, so that's polynomial time algorithms. What other classes of algorithms are there? What's so that usually they they designate polynomials as the letter p. Yeah, there's also np, np complete, and np hard. Yeah. Can you try to disentangle those and 
by trying to define them simply? Right. So a polynomial time algorithm is one which, whose running time is bounded by a polynomial in the size of the input. Uh, there's the, then there's that, the class of such algorithms is called P. In the worst case, by the way, we should say, right? Yeah, so for and, and every yes, case of the right. problem. And that's very important that in this theory, um, when we measure the complexity of an algorithm, we really measure the number of step, the growth of the number of steps in the worst case. So you may have an algorithm that um, runs very rapidly in most cases, but if there's any case where it gets into a very long computation, that would increase the computational complexity by this measure. And that's a very important issue because there, are, uh, as we may discuss later, there are some very important algorithms which don't have a good standing from the point of view of their worst case performance and yet are very effective. So, so uh, theoreticians are interested in P, the class of problems solvable in polynomial time. Then there's um, uh, NP, which is the class of problems which may be hard to solve, but where the where where when confronted with a solution, you can check it in polynomial time. Let me give you an example there. So if we look at the assignment problem, uh, so you have uh, n boys, you have n girls, you have the number of numbers that you need to write down to specify the problem instances n squared. And the question is, um, how many steps are needed to solve it? And um, Jack Edmonds and I were the first to show that it could be done in time n cubed. Uh, earlier algorithms required n to the fourth. So as a polynomial function of the size of the input, this is a fast algorithm. Now to illustrate the class NP, the question is how long would it take to um, verify that a solution is optimal? So for example, if, um, if the input was a graph, we might want to um, find the largest clique in the graph, or a, a clique is a set of vertices such that any vertex, each vertex in the set is adjacent to each of the others. So the uh, clique is a complete subgraph. Yeah, so if it's a Facebook social network, everybody's friends with everybody else, it's a close clique of friends. Oh, that would be what's called a complete graph, it would be. No, I mean, yeah. uh, within that clique. Uh, within that clique, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Every, <laughs> <laughs> they're all friends. So a complete graph is when... Everybody uh, is friendly. As everybody is friends with everybody, yeah. Yeah. So the problem might be to uh, determine whether in a given graph there exists a clique of a certain size. Now well, that turns out to be a very hard problem. But how? But if somebody hands you a clique and asks you to check whether it is a, a, a hands you a set of vertices and asks you to check whether it's a clique, um, you could do that simply by exhaustively looking at all of the edges between the vertices and the clique and verifying that they're all there. And that's a polynomial time algorithm. And that's a polynomial. <laughs> so the verify there the problem of finding the clique appears to be extremely hard, but the problem of verifying a clique uh, to see if it reaches a target number of vertices um, is easy to saw, uh, is easy to verify. So finding the clique is hard, checking it is easy. Problems of that nature are called uh, non-deterministic polynomial time algorithms, and that's the class NP. And what about MP complete and MP hard? Okay, let's talk about problems where you're getting a yes, no, a yes or no answer rather than a numerical value. So either there is a a perfect matching of the of the uh, boys with the girls, or there is, there isn't. It's clear that um, every problem in P is also in 
NP. If you can solve the problem exactly, then you can certainly verify the solution. On the other hand, there are problems in the class NP. This is the class of problems that are easy to check, although they may be hard to solve. It's not at all clear that problems in NP lie in P. So, for example, if we're looking at scheduling classes at a school, the fact that you can verify when handed a schedule for the school, whether it meets all the requirements, that doesn't mean that you can find the schedule rapidly. So, intuitively, NP, non-deterministic polynomial, checking rather than finding, um, is going to be harder than uh, is going to include uh, is, is easier checking is easier and therefore the class of problems that can be checked appears to be much larger than the class of problems that can be solved and then you keep adding appears to and uh sort of these uh, additional words that designate that we don't know for sure yet we right? don't know for sure what kind of visualization do you like do you do when you're trying to think about We'll get to combinatorial algorithms, but just algorithms in general. Yeah. What kind of what what's inside your mind when you're thinking about designing algorithms, or or even just tackling any any mathematical problem? Well, I think that usually an algorithm is uh, involves a uh, repetition of some inner loop, <laughs> and. And so I can sort of visualize the um, the distance from the desired solution as iteratively reducing until you finally hit the exact solution. And try to take steps that get you closer to the... Try to, to get, take steps that get closer and having the certainty of converging. So it's, it's, very, it's basically the, the mechanics of the algorithm is often very simple, um, but especially when you're trying something out on the computer. So, for example, um, uh, I did some work on the traveling salesman problem, and uh, I could see there was a particular function that had to be minimized, and it was fascinating to see the successive approaches to the minimum, to the optimum. You mean, so first of all, a traveling salesman problem is where you have to visit uh, every city without ever... The only ones. Yeah, that's right. Find the shortest path the through shortest a set of cities. The, yeah, uh, which is sort of a canonical, a standard, a really nice problem that's really hard. In right, that's exactly, yes. <laughs> uh, so can, can you say again, what was nice about the objective, uh, being able to think about the objective function there and maximizing it or minimizing it? Well, it's just that, that the um, as the algorithm proceeded, it was, you were making mm -hmm. progress, continual progress. and and eventually getting to the optimum point. So there's two two parts, maybe. Maybe you can correct me. But first is like getting an intuition about what the solution would look like. And, or even maybe coming up with a solution. And two is proving that this thing is actually going to be pretty good. Uh, what part is harder for you? Where does the magic happen? Is it in the first sets of intuitions? Or is it in the detail, the messy details of actually showing that it is going to get to the exact solution and it's going to run at this at, at a certain complexity? Well, the, the the magic is just the fact that it the, that the gap from the optimum decreases monotonically, and you can see it happening, and. Um, various metrics of what's going on are improving all, all along until finally you hit the optimum. Perhaps later we'll talk about the assignment problem and I can illustrate. <laughs> illustrate a little better. Yeah. My favorite is probably all the all the work with network flows. So anytime you have, uh, I don't know why it's so compelling, but there's something just beautiful about it. It seems like there's so many applications and communication networks. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, traffic right. flow that you can map into these. And then you can think of pipes and water going through pipes and you can optimize it in different ways. There's something always visually and intellectually compelling to me about it. And 
of course you've done work there yeah yeah so um so there uh, the edges represent uh, channels along which some commodity can flow it might be gas it might be water it might be information maybe supply chain as well like products being products delivered. flowing from one operation to another yeah and uh, the edges have a capacity which is the rate at which the commodity can flow and uh, a central problem is to determine given a network of these channels in, in this case the edges are communication channels um the uh the, the challenge is to find the maximum rate at which the uh, information can flow along these channels to get from a source to a destination and uh, that's a, that's a fundamental combinatorial problem that i i've worked on uh jointly with um the scientist Jack Edmonds, we, I think, were the first to give a formal proof that uh, this maximum flow problem through a network uh, can be solved in polynomial time. Which uh, I remember the first time I learned that, just learning that in uh, maybe even grad school. I don't think it was even undergrad. No, algorithm, yeah. Do network flows get taught in in um, basic algorithms courses? Yes, probably. Okay, so yeah, I've, I remember being very surprised that max flow is a polynomial time algorithm. Yeah. That there's a nice fast algorithm that solves max flow. But, so there is an algorithm named after you, an admins, the admin carp algorithm for max flow. So w what was it like tackling that problem and trying to arrive at a polynomial time solution? And maybe you can describe the algorithm, maybe you can describe what's the running time complexity that you showed. Yeah. Well, well let's jump into the network of switches and talk about combinatorial algorithms if we could. Let's step back with the very basics. What are combinatorial algorithms? And what are some major examples of problems they aim to solve? A combinatorial algorithm is, uh, is one which deals with a, um, a system of discrete objects that can uh, occupy various states or take on various values from a discrete set of values um, and need to be arranged or or, um, uh, or selected um, in such a way as to uh, achieve some to minimize some cost function or to prove or to prove the existence of some combinatorial configuration. So an example would be um, coloring the vertices of a graph. What's a graph? <laughs> <laughs> Let's step back. So what, uh, and it's fun to, uh, to ask one of the greatest computer scientists of all time the most basic questions in the beginning of most books. But for people who might not know, but in general, how you think about it, what is, what is a graph? Uh, a graph that's that's simple it's a, it's a set of points certain pairs of which are joined by lines called edges and they sort of represent the in different applications represent the interconnections between uh discrete objects so they could be the interactions interconnections between switches in a digital circuit or interconnections indicating the communication patterns of a human community. Um, and they could be directed or undirected, and then, as you've mentioned before, might have costs. Right, on, they uh, can be directed or undirected. They, they can be, you can think of them as, uh, if, you, if, if you think, if a graph were representing a communication network, then the edge could be undirected, meaning that information could flow along it in both directions, or it could be directed with only one-way communication. A road system is another example of a graph with weights on the edges. And then a lot of problems of uh, optimizing the efficiency of such networks or learning about the performance of such networks um, uh, are, the, are the, the object of combinatorial algorithms. So it could be 
uh, scheduling classes at a school where uh, the, uh, the the vertices, the nodes of the network, are the individual classes, and uh, the edges indicate the constraints, which say that certain classes cannot take place at the same time, or certain teachers are available only at cert- for certain classes, etc. Or um, I talked earlier about the assignment problem of matching the boys with the girls, um, uh, where um, you have a, there a graph with an edge from each boy to each girl uh, with a weight indicating the cost. Or um, in uh, logical design of computers, you might want to find a set of so-called gates, switches to the, that perform logical functions, which can be interconnected to realize some function. So you you might ask, um, um, uh, how many gates do you need in order to um, um, for a, for a um, circuit to give uh, a yes output if at least a given number of its inputs are ones, and no, if not, if fewer are, are present. So you've also have developed yourself some elegant, beautiful algorithms. Again, picking your children. So the the the, the Robin Carp algorithm for string searching, pattern matching, Edmund Carp algorithm for max flows we mentioned, Hopcroft Carp algorithm for finding maximum cardinality matchings in bipartite graphs. Is there ones that stand out to you as ones you're most proud of, or just um, whether it's beauty, elegance, or just being the right discovery development in your life that you're especially proud of? I like the rabin Karp algorithm because it illustrates the power of uh, randomization. So um, the, the problem there is to um, is to uh, decide whether uh, a given long string of symbols from some alphabet contains a given word, whether a particular word occurs within some very much longer word. And so the the idea of the um, algorithm is to associate with the word that we're looking for, a fingerprint, mm-hmm. some some number or some combinatorial object that describes that word, and then to look for an occurrence of that same fingerprint as you slide along the longer word. And what we do is we asso- associate with each word, a number. So we, first of all, we think of the letters that kind of occur in a word as the digits of, let's say, decimal or whatever base here, whatever number of of different symbols there are in the That's the base of of the numbers, yeah. Right, so every word can then be thought of as a number with the letters being the digits of that number. And then we pick a random prime number in a certain range, and we take that word viewed as a number and take the remainder on dividing dividing that number by the prime. So coming up with a nice hash function. It's a a kind of hash function. Yeah. Um, It gives you a little little shortcut for, for that particular word. Yeah. That, so that's the that's the. Um, it's very different than the any uh, and other algorithms of its kind that were trying to do search, uh, um, string matching. Yeah, right? which but, are usually are combinatorial and don't involve the, the idea of taking a random fingerprint. Yes, and doing the fingerprinting has two advantages. One is that as we slide along the long word, digit by digit, we can. We, we keep a window of, of a certain size, the size of the word we're looking for, and we, we 
compute the fingerprint of every say, stretch of that length. And it turns out that it, just a couple of arithmetic op operations will take you from the fingerprint of one part to what you get when you slide over by one position. So the computation of all the fingerprints is um, simple. And, se and secondly, it's unlikely if the prime is chosen randomly from a certain range that you will get two of the segments in question having the same fingerprint. Right. And so there's a small probability of error which can be checked after the fact and also the ease of doing the computation because you're working with these fingerprints which are remainders modulo some big prime. So that's the magical thing about randomized algorithms is that if you add a little bit of uh, randomness, it somehow allows you to take a pretty naive approach, a simple looking approach and allow it to run extremely well. Uh, so can you maybe take a step back and say, like, what is a randomized algorithm, this category of algorithms? Well, it's um, just the ability to draw a random number from such, um, from some range or to uh, to associate a random number with some object or to draw at random from some set. So uh, another example is, um, very simple if we're conducting a presidential election and uh, we would like to pick the winner, um, in principle, we could draw a random sample of all of the voters in the country. And if it was of, si of substantial size, say a few thousand, then the most popular candidate in that group would be very likely to be the correct choice that would come out of counting all the millions of votes. Uh, now, of course, we can't do this because, first of all, everybody has to feel that his or her vote counted. And secondly, we can't really do a purely random sample from that population. And I guess, thirdly, there could be a tie, in which case um, we wouldn't have a significant difference between two candidates. But those things uh -huh. aside, if you didn't have all that messiness of human beings, you could prove that that kind of random picking would you come just that random it. picking would would be uh, would solve the problem with a very with a very low probability of error. Another example is um, testing whether a number is prime. So if I want to test whether uh, seventeen is prime, I could pick uh, any number between one and seventeen. And raise it to the sixteenth power modulo seventeen, and it and you should get back the original number. That's a famous uh, formula due to Fermat about uh, it's called Fermat's little theorem that um, if you take any a any number a in the range uh, zero through n minus one, and raise it to the n minus one uh, power modulo n you'll get back the number A, <laughs> if the number is, if A is prime. Yeah. So if you don't get back the number A, that's a proof that a number is not prime. Wow. <laughs> and you can show that, um, suitably define the, the, the probability that you will get uh, a value unequal, you will get a violation of Fermat's result is very high. And so this gives you a way of uh, rapidly proving that a number is not prime. It's a little more complicated than that because uh, there are certain values of n where something a little more elaborate has to be done, but that's the basic idea. Use, uh, taking an identity that holds for primes and therefore if it ever fails on any instance for a non-prime, you, uh, uh, you know that the number is not prime. It's a quick choice, a fast choice, fast proof that a number is not prime. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more of what's your intuition why randomness works so well and results in such simple algorithms? Well, uh, the example of conducting an election where you could 
take in in theory you could take a sample and depend on the validity of the sample to really represent the whole is a just the basic fact of statistics which gives a lot of opportunities um and uh, I actually exploited that sort of random random sampling idea in uh, designing an algorithm for uh, counting the number of solutions to, that satisfy a particular uh, formula in propositional cal uh, propositional logic. A particular, so some 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 uh, version of the satisfiability problem, or a, ver a version of the satisfiability problem. Um, is there some interesting insight that you want to elaborate on? Like what, uh, what some aspect of that algorithm that might be useful to describe? So you you have a uh, a uh, collection of uh, formulas, and you want to count the number of solutions that satisfy. Uh, at least one of the formulas. And you can count the number of solutions that satisfy any particular one of the formulas, but you have to account for the fact that that solution might be counted many times if it solves more than one of the formulas. Mm -hmm. And so what, what you do is you... Uh, sample from the formulas according to the number of solutions that satisfy each individual one. In that way, you draw a random solution, but then you correct by looking at the number of formulas that satisfy that random solution and uh, and don't double count. So if, if you, you can think of it this way. So you have a... Uh, a matrix of zeros and ones, and you want to know how many columns of that matrix contain at least one one. And you can count in each row how many ones there are. So what you can do is draw from the rows according to the number of ones. If a row has more ones, it gets drawn more frequently. But then if you draw from that row, you have to go up the column and looking at where that same one is repeated in different rows and only counted as a success or a hit if it's the earliest row that contains the one. Right. And uh, that gives you a robust statistical estimate of the total number of columns that contain at least one of the ones. So that that uh, is an example of the same principle that was used in studying random sampling. Another viewpoint is that if you have a phenomenon that occurs almost all the time, then if you sample one of the occasions where it occurs, you're most likely to, and you're looking for an occurrence, a random occurrence is likely to work. So that comes up in solving identities, solving algebraic identities. You you get um, two formulas that may look very different. You want to know if they're really identical. What you can what you can do is just pick a random value and evaluate the formulas at those two at that value and see if they seeing if they agree. And you depend on the fact that if the formulas are distinct, then they're going to disagree a lot. And so therefore a random choice will exhibit the disagreement. And if there are many ways for the two to disagree, uh, and you only need to find one disagreement, then r random choice is likely to yield it. And in general, uh, now zooming out again, as you write, Don Knuth has called attention to a breed of people who uh, derive great aesthetic pleasure from contemplating the structure of computational processes. So Don calls these folks geeks. Mm -hmm. And you write that you remember the moment you realized you were such a person, you were shown the Hungarian algorithm to solve the assignment problem. Right. So perhaps you can explain what the assignment problem is and what uh, the Hungarian algorithm is. So in the assignment problem, you have uh, 
in boys and in girls. And you are given the desirability of, uh, or, or the cost of matching the ith boy with the jth girl for all I and J. You're given a matrix of numbers. And you want to find the one to one matching of the boys with the girls such that the sum of the associated costs will be minimized. So the the, the best way to match the boys with the girls or men with jobs or any two sets. Um, Not any possible matching is possible? or is uh, Yeah, I, all one-to-one correspondences are permiss- permissible. If there is a connection that is not allowed, then you can think of it as having an infinite cost. I see, yeah. So um, what you do is uh, to depend on the observation that the identity of the optimal assignment, or as we call it, the optimal permutation, um, is not changed if you subtract um, a constant from any row or column of the matrix. You can see that the comparison between the different assignments is not changed by that. Um, because your penal, if you decrease a particular row, all the elements of a row by some constant, all solutions decrease by the cost of that, by an, an amount equal to that constant. So the idea of the algorithm is to start with a matrix of non negative numbers and keep subtracting from rows or from or or entire columns um, in in such a way that you subtract the, the same constant from all the elements of that row or column uh, while maintaining the property that um, uh, all the elements are non negative simple yeah and so and so um what you have to do is uh, is find small moves which will decrease the total cost um, while uh, subtracting constants from rows or columns. And there's a particular way of doing that by computing a kind of shortest path through the elements in the matrix. Uh, and you just keep going in this way um, until you finally get a a full permutation of zeros while the matrix is non-negative, and then you know that that has to be the cheapest. Is that as um, simple as it sounds? So the the well, shortest path to the matrix part. Yeah, the simplicity lies in how you find the what you, I oversimplified slightly. What you 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 will end up uh, subtracting a constant from some rows or columns and adding. Uh, the same constant back to other rows and columns, uh, so as not to uh, not, not to reduce any of the zero elements. Leave, you leave them unchanged, um, but um, uh, each individual step modifies a, 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 a several rows and columns by the same amount, but overall decreases the cost. So there's something about that elegance that made you go aha this is a beautiful like it's it's uh it's amazing that something like this something so simple can solve a problem like this yeah it's it's really cool if i had mechanical ability i would probably like to do w- woodworking or other activities where you sort of shape something uh in, in into something beautiful and orderly and there's something about the orderly systematic nature of uh, that iterative algorithm that is pleasing to me. So just, just to linger on the idea of an ethical algorithm, of idea of groups, sort of group thinking and individual thinking. And we're struggling that. You know, one of the amazing things about algorithms and your book and just this field of study is it gets us to ask, like forcing machines converting these ideas into algorithms is forcing us to ask questions of ourselves as a human civilization. So there's a lot of people now in public discourse doing sort of group thinking, 
thinking like there's particular sets of groups that we don't want to discriminate against and so on. And then there is individuals, sort of in the individual life stories, the struggles they went through and so on. Now, like in philosophy, it's easier to do group thinking because you don't, <laughs> you don't, it's very hard to think about individuals. There, there's so much variability. But with data, you can start to actually say, you know what, group thinking is too crude. You're actually dis doing more discrimination by thinking in terms of groups and individuals. Can you linger on that kind of idea of group versus individual and in, in ethics? And, and uh, is it good to continue thinking in terms of groups in, in algorithms? So let me start by answering a very good high-level question with a slightly narrow technical response, which is, these group definitions of fairness, like here's a few groups, like different racial groups, maybe gender groups, maybe age, what have you. And let's make sure that, you know, for none of these groups do we, um, you know, have a false negative rate, which is much higher than any other one of these groups. Okay. Right. So these are kind of classic group aggregate notions of fairness. And, you know, but at the end of the day, an individual you can think of as a combination of all of their attributes, right? They're a member of a racial group. They're, they have a, a gender, um, they have an age, you know, and many other, you know, demographic properties that are not biological, but that, you know, are, are still, you know, very strong determinants of outcome and personality and the like. So, so one, I think, useful spectrum is to sort of think about that array between the group and the specific individual, mm -hmm. and to realize that in some ways, asking for fairness at the individual level is to sort of ask for group fairness simultaneously for all possible combinations of groups. So in particular, <laughs> yeah. so in particular, yes. you know, if I build a predictive model that meets some definition of fairness by race, by gender, by age, by what have you, mm -hmm. marginally, to get it slightly technical, sort of independently, I shouldn't expect that model to not to discriminate against disabled Hispanic women over age 55 making less than $50,000 a year annually, even though I might have protected each one of those attributes marginally. So the optimization, actually, that, that's a fascinating way to put it. So you're just optimizing. It's so one way to achieve the optimizing fairness for individuals just to add more and more definitions of groups that each individual right. belongs so, to. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, we could think of all of ourselves as groups of size one, because yeah. eventually there's some attribute that separates you from me and everybody from everybody else in the world, yes. okay? And so it, it is possible to put, you know, these incredibly coarse ways of thinking about fairness and these very, very individualistic specific ways yeah. on a common scale. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things we've worked on from a research perspective is, you know, so we sort of know how to, you know, we, in relative terms, we know how to provide fairness guarantees at the coarsest end of the scale. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to provide kind of sensible, tractable, realistic fairness guarantees at the individual level. But maybe we could start creeping towards that by dealing with more, you know, refined subgroups. I mean, we we gave a name to this phenomenon where, you know, you protect, you, you, you enforce some definition of fairness for a bunch of marginal attributes or features, but then you find yourself discriminating against a, a combination of them. We call that fairness gerrymandering, hmm. because like <laughs> political gerrymandering, you know, you're, you're giving some guarantee at the aggregate level. Yes. Um, but that when you kind of look in a more granular way at what's going on, you realize that you're achieving that aggregate guarantee by sort of favoring some groups and discriminating against other ones. And, and so there are, you know, it's early days, but there are algorithmic approaches that let you start creep, you know, creeping towards that, you know, individual end of the spectrum. Does there need to be human input in the form of weighing the value of the importance of each kind of group so for example is it is it like so gender say uh crudely speaking male and female and then different races are we as humans supposed to put value on saying gender is 0.6 and race is 0.4 in terms of uh in the big optimization of 
achieving fairness. Is that kind of what humans are I mean, supposed to do you know, here? I mean, of course, you know, I don't need to tell you that, of course, technically one could incorporate such weights if you wanted to into a definition of fairness. You know, fairness is an interesting topic in that having worked in, in the book being about both fairness, privacy, and many other social norms, fairness, of course, is a much, much more loaded topic. So privacy, I mean, people want privacy. People don't like violations of privacy. Violations of privacy cause damage, angst, and, and bad publicity for the companies that are victims of them. But sort of everybody agrees more data privacy would be better than less data privacy. Right. And, and you don't have these, somehow the discussions of fairness don't become politicized along other dimensions like race and about gender and, you know, you know whether we, should, and, and, you know, it, it, you quickly find yourself kind of revisiting topics that have been kind of unresolved forever, like affirmative action. Right. Sort of, you know, like, why are you protecting, you know, some people will say, why are you protecting this particular racial group? And, and others will say, well, we need to do that as a matter of, of retribution. Other people will say it's a matter of economic opportunity. And I don't know which of, you know, whether <laughs> yeah. any of these are the right answers, but you sort of, fairness is sort of special in that as soon as you start talking about it, you inevitably have to participate in debates about fair to whom, at what expense to who else. I mean, even in criminal justice, right, um, you know, where people talk about fairness in criminal sentencing or, um, you know, predicting failures to appear or making parole decisions or the like, they will, you know, they'll point out that well, these definitions of fairness are all about fairness for the criminals. And what about fairness for the victims, right? So when I, when I basically say something like, well, the, the false incarceration rate for black people and white people mm -hmm. needs to be roughly the same, you know, there's no mention of potential victims of criminals in such a fairness definition. And that's the realm of public discourse. I, I should actually recommend, I just listened to uh, to people listening, Intelligence Squares Debates, uh, US edition, just had a, a debate. They have this structure where you have uh, like, old Oxford style or whatever they're called, debates, and it was two versus two, and they talked about affirmative action. And it was, it was incredibly interesting that it's still, that there's really good points on every side of this issue, which is fascinating to listen to. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And so it's it's interesting to be a researcher trying to do, <laughs> for the most part, technical algorithmic work. Yeah. But Aaron and I both quickly learned you cannot do that and then go out and talk about it and expect people to take it seriously if you're unwilling to engage in these broader debates yes. that are are entirely extra algorithmic, right? They're 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 not about you know, algorithms and making algorithms better, they're sort of, you know, as you said, sort of like, what should society be protecting in the first place? At the high level, and I'll ask some sort of basic questions with the hope to get at the fundamental nature of reality, but <laughs> from a very high level, what is an ethical algorithm? So I can say that an algorithm has a running time of using big O notation and log N. I can say that a machine learning algorithm cl classify cat versus dog with 97% accuracy. Do you think there will one day be a way to measure sort of in the same compelling way as the big O notation of this algorithm is 97% ethical? First of all, let me riff for a second on your specific N log N example. Mm -hmm. So because early in the book, when we're just kind of trying to describe algorithms, period, we say like, okay, you know, what's an example of an algorithm or an algorithmic problem? First of all, like it's sorting, right? You have a bunch of index cards with numbers on them and you want to sort them. And we describe, you know, an algorithm that sweeps all the way through, finds the, the smallest number, puts it at the front, then sweeps through again, finds the second smallest number. So we make the point that this is an algorithm and it's also a bad algorithm in the sense that, you know, it's quadratic rather than n log n, which we know is kind of optimal for sorting. 
and we make the point that sort of like, you know, so even within the confines of a very precisely specified problem, there, you know, there might be many, many different algorithms for the same problem with different properties. Like some might be faster in terms of running time, some might use less memory, some might have, you know, better distributed implementations. And, and so the point is, is that already we're used to, you know, in computer science, thinking about trade-offs between different types of quantities and resources, mm -hmm. and there being, you know, better and worse algorithms. And, and our book is about that part of algorithmic ethics that we know how to kind of put on that same kind of quantitative footing right now. So, you know, just to say something that our book is not about, our, our book is not about kind of broad, fuzzy notions of fairness. Mm -hmm. It's about very specific notions of fairness. There's more than one of them. Um, there are tensions between them, right? But if you pick one of them, you can do something akin to saying that this algorithm is 97% ethical. You can say, for instance, the, you know, th for this lending model, the false rejection rate on black people and white people is within 3%, mm -hmm. right? So we might call that to a 97% ethical algorithm and a 100% ethical algorithm would mean that that difference is 0%. Mm -hmm. In that case, fairness is specified when, two groups, however they're defined, are given to you. That's so, right. So the, and, and then you can sort of mathematically start describing the algorithm, but nevertheless, the, the part where the two groups are given to you, I mean, unlike running time, you know, we don't in computer science talk about how fast an algorithm feels like when it runs. True. <laughs> we measure it and ethical starts getting into feelings. So for example, an algorithm runs, you know, if it runs in the background, it doesn't disturb the performance of my system, it'll feel nice, I'll be okay with it. But if it overloads the system, it'll feel unpleasant. So in that same way, ethics, there's a feeling of how socially acceptable it is. How does it represent the, the moral standards of our society today? So in that sense, and sorry to linger on that, first of high level philosophical question is, do you have a sense we'll be able to measure how ethical an algorithm is? First of all, I didn't, certainly didn't mean to give the impression that you can kind of measure, you know, memory speed trade-offs, right. you know, and, and that there's a complete, you know, mapping from that onto kind of fairness, for instance, or yeah. ethics and, and accuracy, for example. In the type of fairness definitions that are largely the objects of study today and starting to be deployed, you as the user of the definitions, you need to make some hard decisions before you even get to the point of designing fair algorithms. Um, one of them, for instance, is deciding who it is that you're worried about protecting, who you're worried about being harmed by, for instance, some notion of discrimination or unfairness. And then you need to also decide what constitutes harm. So for instance, in a lending application, maybe you decide that you know, falsely rejecting a creditworthy individual, um, you know, sort of a false negative is the real harm and that false positives, i.e. people that are not creditworthy or are not going to repay your loan, that get a loan, you might think of them as lucky. Um, and so that's not a harm, although it's not clear that if you are don't have the means to repay a loan, that being given a loan is not also a harm. So, you know, you know, the the literature is sort of so far quite limited in that you sort of need to say who do you want to protect and what would constitute harm to that group, and, and when you ask questions like will algorithms feel ethical, one way in which they won't under the definitions that I'm describing is if you know if you are an individual who is falsely denied a loan, right. incorrectly denied a loan. All of these definitions basically say like, well, you know, your compensation is the knowledge that we are, we are also falsely denying loans to other people, you know, in yeah. other groups at the same rate that we're doing it to you. And, and, you know, there, and so there is actually this interesting, even technical tension in the field right now between these sort of group notions of fairness 
and notions of fairness that might actually feel like real fairness to individuals, right? They, they might really feel like their particular interests are being protected or thought about by the algorithm rather than just, you know, the groups that they happen to be members of. Is there parallels to the big O notation of worst case analysis? So is it important to looking at the worst violation of fairness for an individual, is it important to minimize that one individual? So like worst case analysis, is that something you think about or? I mean, I think we're not even at the point where we can sensibly think about that. So, so first of all, you know, we're talking here both about fairness applied at the group level, which is a relatively weak thing, but it's better than nothing. And also the more ambitious thing of trying to to give some individual promises. But even that doesn't incorporate, I think, something that you're hinting at here is what a child might call subjective fairness, right? right? So a lot of the definitions, I mean, all of the definitions in the algorithmic fairness literature are what I would kind of call received wisdom definitions. It's sort of, mm -hmm. you know, somebody like me sits around and thinks like, okay, you know, I think here's a technical definition of fairness that mm -hmm. I think people should want or that they should you know, think of as some notion of fairness, maybe not the only one, maybe not the best one, maybe not the last one. But we really actually don't know from a subjective standpoint, like what people really think is fair. There's, mm -hmm. you know, we, we just started doing a little bit of work in, in our group at actually doing kind of human subject mm -hmm. experiments in which we, you know, ask people, about, you know, we, we, we ask them questions about fairness, we survey them, we, you know, we show them pairs of individuals in, let's say, a criminal recidivism prediction setting, and we ask them, do you think these two individuals should be treated the same as a matter of fairness? And to my knowledge, there's not a large literature in which ordinary people are asked about you know, they, they have sort of notions of their subjective fairness elicited from them. Mm -hmm. um, it's mainly, you know, kind of scholars who think about fairness, you know, right. kind of making up their own definitions. And I think, I think this needs to change actually for many social norms, not just for fairness, right? So there's a lot of you know, discussion these days in the AI community about interpretable AI or understandable AI. And as far as I can tell, Everybody agrees that deep learning, or at least the outputs of deep learning, are not very understandable. And people might agree that sparse linear models with integer coefficients are more understandable. Mm -hmm. But nobody's really asked people. You know, there's very little literature on, you know, s sort of showing people models and asking them, do they understand what the model is doing? And I think that in all of these topics, as these fields mature, we need to start doing more behavioral work. Yeah, which is, so one of my deep passions is psychology. And I always thought computer scientists will be the, the best future psychologists <laughs> in the sense that data is, um, especially in this modern world, the data is a really powerful way to understand and study human behavior. And you've explored that with your game the your theory side of work as well. Yeah. I I'd like to think that what you say is true about computer scientists and psychology from my own limited wandering into human subject experiments. We have a great deal to learn. Not just computer science, but AI and machine learning more specifically, I, I kind of think of as imperialist research communities in that, you know, kind of like physicists in an earlier generation, computer scientists kind of don't think of any scientific topic as off limits to them. They will like freely wander into areas that others have been thinking about for decades or longer. Yes. And, you know, we usually tend to embarrass ourselves yes. in those efforts for, for some amount of time. Like, you know, I think reinforcement learning is a good example, right? So, a lot of the early work in reinforcement learning, I have complete sympathy for the, con the control theorists that looked at this and said like, okay, you are reinventing stuff that we've known since like the 40s, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, in my view, eventually this sort of, you know, computer scientists have made significant contributions to that field, even though we kind of embarrassed ourselves for the first decade. So I think if computer scientists are going to start engaging in kind of psychology, human subjects 
type of research, we should expect to be embarrassing ourselves for a good 10 years or so, and then hope that it turns out as well as you know some other areas that we've waded into. So you've kind of mentioned that. But I, I do think, you know, obviously, despite disclaimer that people like us shouldn't be making those decisions for society, we, we are kind of living in a world where, in many ways, computer scientists have made some decisions that have fundamentally changed the nature of our society and democracy and, and sort of civil discourse and deliberation in ways that I think most people generally feel are bad these days, right? So, But they had to make, so if we look at people at the heads of companies and so on, they had to make those decisions, right? There has to be decisions. So there's there's two options. Either you kind of put your head in the sand and don't think about these things and just let the algorithm do what it does, or you make decisions about what you value, you know, of injecting moral values into the algorithm. Look, I don't. I, I never mean to be a, an apologist for the tech industry, but I think it's it's a little bit too far to sort of say that explicit decisions were made about these things. So let's, for instance, take social media platforms, right? So like many inventions in technology and computer science, a lot of these platforms that we now use regularly kind of started as curiosities, right? I remember when things like Facebook came out and its predecessors like Friendster, which nobody even remembers now. <laughs> people people really wonder like what why would anybody want to spend time doing that you know what i mean even even the web when it first came out when it wasn't populated with much content and it was largely kind of hobbyists building their own kind of ramshackle websites a lot of people looked at this as like well, what is the purpose of this thing why is this interesting who would want to do this and so even things like facebook and twitter yes technical decisions were made by engineers by scientists by executives in the design of those platforms but you know i don't i don't think 10 years ago anyone anticipated that those platforms for instance might kind of acquire undue you know influence on political discourse or on the outcomes of elections and I think the scrutiny that these companies are getting now is entirely appropriate, but I think it's a little too harsh to kind of look at history and sort of say like, oh, you should have been able to anticipate that this would happen with your platform. Mm -hmm. And in the sort of gaming chapter of the book, one of the points we're making is that, you know, these platforms, right, they don't operate in isolation. So like, the, unlike the other topics we're discussing, like fairness and privacy, like those are really cases where algorithms can operate on your data and make decisions about you and you're not even aware of it okay mm -hmm. things like facebook and twitter these are you know these are these are systems right these are social systems and their evolution even their technical evolution because machine learning is involved is driven in no small part by the behavior of the users themselves and how the users decide to adopt them and how to use them yeah. and so you know you know i'm kind of like who really knew that that you know in, until until we saw it happen? Who knew that these things might be able to influence the outcome of elections? Who knew that you know they might polarize political discourse because of the ability to you know decide who you interact with on the platform and also with the platform naturally using machine learning to optimize for your own interests that they would further isolate us from each other. And you know, like feed us all basically just the stuff that we already agreed with, and so I think it, you know we we've come to that outcome I think largely, but I think it's something that we all learned together, including the companies, as these things happen. Mm -hmm. Now you asked like, well, are there algorithmic remedies to these kinds of things? And um, again, these are big problems that are not going to be solved with you know somebody going in and changing a few lines of code somewhere in a social media platform. But I, I do think in many ways, there are, there are definitely ways of making things better. I mean, like an obvious recommendation that we, we make at some point in the book is like, look, you know, to the extent that we think that machine learning applied for personalization purposes in things like newsfeed, you know, or other platforms, um, has led to polarization and intolerance of opposing viewpoints. 
as you know, right, these, these algorithms have models, right? And they kind of place people in some kind of metric space and, and they place content in that space and they sort of know the extent to which I have an affinity for a particular type mm -hmm. of content. And by the same token, they also probably have a, that, that same model probably gives you a good idea of the stuff I'm likely to violently disagree with or be offended by. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, in this case, there really is some knob you could tune that says like, instead of showing people only what they like and what they want, let's show them some stuff that we think that they don't like, or that's a little bit further away. And you could even imagine users being able to control this, you know, just like a, you know, everybody gets a slider mm -hmm. and you, that slider says like, you know, how much stuff do you want to see that's kind of, you know, you might disagree with, or is at least further from your interests? Like an, it's almost like an exploration button. Mm -hmm. So just get your intuition. Do you think engagement, so like you staying on the platform, you be staying engaged, do you think fairness, ideas of fairness won't emerge? Like how bad is it to just optimize for engagement? Do you think we'll run into big trouble if we're just optimizing for how much you love the platform? Well, I mean, optimizing for engagement kind of got us where we are. So do you, one, have faith that it's possible to do better? And two, if it is, how do we do better? I mean, it's definitely possible to do different, right? And again, you know, it's not as if I think that doing something different than optimizing for engagement won't cost these companies in real ways, including revenue and profitability, potentially. In um, the short term, at least. Yeah, in the short term, right. And again, you know, if I worked at these companies, I'm sure that it, it would have seemed like the most natural thing in the world also to want to optimize engagement, right? And that's good for users in some sense. You want them to be, you know, vested in the platform and enjoying it and finding it useful, interesting, and or productive. But, you know, my point is, is that the idea that there is, that it's sort of out of their hands, as you said, or that there's nothing to do about it, never say never, but that strikes me as implausible as a machine learning person, right? I mean, these companies are driven by machine learning and this optimization of engagement is essentially driven by machine learning, right? It's driven by um, not just machine learning, but, you know, very, very large scale A, B experimentation where you kind of tweak some element of the user interface or tweak some component of an algorithm or tweak some component or feature of your click-through prediction model. And my point is, is that anytime you know how to optimize for something, you, you know, by def, almost by definition, that solution tells you how not to optimize for it or to do something different. Engagement can be measured. So sort of optimizing for sort of minimizing divisiveness or maximizing intellectual growth over the lifetime of a human being are very difficult to measure. That that's right. So I'm not I'm not claiming that doing something different will immediately make it apparent that this is a good thing for society. And in particular, I mean I think one way of thinking about where we are on some of these social media platforms is that you know it kind of feels a bit like we're in a bad equilibrium, right? Mm -hmm. That these systems are helping us all kind of optimize something myopically and selfishly for ourselves. And of course, from an individual standpoint at any given moment, like wh why would I want to see things in my newsfeed that I found irrelevant, offensive, or, you know, or the like, okay? Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe by all of us you know, having these platforms myopically optimize in our interests, we have reached a collective outcome as a society that we're unhappy with in different ways. Let's say with respect to things like, you know, political discourse and tolerance of opposing viewpoints. And if uh, Mark Zuckerberg gave you a call and said, I'm thinking of taking a sabbatical, could you run Facebook for me for, for six months? What would you, how... I think no thanks would be my first <laughs> response, but <laughs> no. there are many aspects of being the head of the, the entire company that are kind of entirely exogenous to many of the things that we're discussing here. Yes. Um, and so I don't really think I would need to be CEO of Facebook to kind of implement the you know more limited set of solutions that I might imagine. But I think one one concrete thing they could do is they could experiment 
with letting people who chose to to see more stuff in their news feed that is not entirely kind of chosen to optimize for their particular interests, beliefs, etc. So the the kind of thing is, is so I could speak to YouTube, but I think Facebook probably does something similar. Is they're quite effective at automatically finding what sorts of groups you belong to, not based on race or gender or so on, but based on the kind of stuff you enjoy watching in the case of YouTube. Sort of, it's a, it's a difficult thing for Facebook or YouTube to then say, well, you know what? We're gonna show you something from a very different cluster. Even though we believe algorithmically, you're unlikely to enjoy that thing. Sort of, that's a weird jump to make. There has to be a human, like at the very top of that system that says, well, that will be long-term healthy for you. That's more than an algorithmic decision. Or, or, or that same person could say that'll be long-term healthy for the platform. For the platform. Or for the platform's influence on society outside of the platform, right? And, you know, it's easy for me to sit here and say these things. Yes. But conceptually, I do not think that these are kind of totally or should they, they shouldn't be kind of completely alien ideas, Right, that you know, you could try things like this, and it wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't have to invent entirely new science to do it because if we're all already embedded in some metric space and there's a notion of distance between you and me and every other every piece of content, then you know we know exactly, you know, the, the same model that tells you know that dictates how to make me really happy also tells how to make me as unhappy as possible. Oh, you've worn many hats, one of which, the one that first caused me to become a big fan of your work many years ago is algorithmic trading. So I have to just ask a question about this because you have so much fascinating work there. In the 21st century, what, what role do you think algorithms have in the space of trading, investment, in the financial sector? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, in... The time I've spent on Wall Street and in finance, you know, I've, I've seen a clear progression, and I think it's a progression that kind of models the use of algorithms and automation more generally in society, which is, you know, the, the things that kind of get taken over by the algos first are sort of the things that computers are obviously better at than people, right? So, um you know, so first of all, there needed to be this era of automation, right, where just, you know, financial exchanges became largely electronic, which then enabled the possibility of, you know, trading becoming more algorithmic because once, you know, the exchanges are electronic, an algorithm can submit an order through an API just as well as a human can do at a can monitor. Do it really quickly, it can read all the data. So yeah. Can... And so, you know, I think the, the, the places where algorithmic trading have had the greatest inroads and had the first inroads were in in kind of execution problems, kind of optimized execution problems. So what I mean by that is at a large brokerage firm, for example, one of the lines of business might be on behalf of large institutional clients taking, you know, what we might consider difficult trades. So it's not like a mom and pop investor saying, I want to buy a hundred shares of Microsoft. It's a large hedge fund saying, you know, I want to buy a very, very large stake in Apple and I want to do it over the span of a day. And it's such a large volume that if you're not clever about how you break that trade up, not just over time, but over perhaps multiple different electronic exchanges that all let you trade Apple on their platform, you know, you will you will move, you'll push prices around in a way that hurts your your execution. So, you know, this is the kind of, you know, this is an optimization problem. This is a control problem, right? And so machines are better. We, we know how to design algorithms, you know, that are better at that kind of thing than a person is going to be able to do because we can take volumes of historical and real-time data to kind of optimize the schedule with which we trade. And, you know, similarly, high-frequency trading, um, you know, which is closely related but not the same as optimized execution, where you're just trying to spot very, very temporary, you know, mispricings between exchanges or within an asset itself, or just predict directional movement of a stock because of the kind of very, very low-level granular buying and selling data in the, in the exchange. 
machines are good at this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the mechanics of trading. What about the, can machines do long term sort of prediction? Yeah, so I think we are in an era where, you know, clearly there have been some very successful, you know, quant hedge funds that are, you know, in what we would traditionally call, you know, still in this, the stat arb regime. Like, so, you know, What's that? stat arb referring to statistical arbitrage, but, but for the purposes of this conversation, what it really means is making directional predictions in asset price movement or returns. Your prediction about that directional movement is good for, you know, you, you have a view that it's valid for some period of time between a few seconds and a few days. And that's the amount of time that you're going to kind of get into the position, hold it, and then hopefully be right about the directional movement and, you know, buy low and sell high as the cliche goes. So th th that is a, you know, kind of a sweet spot, I think, for quant trading and investing right now and has been for some time. When you really get to kind of more Warren Buffett style time scales, right? Like, you know, my cartoon of Warren Buffett is that, you know, Warren Buffett sits and thinks what the long-term value of a Apple really should be. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't even look at what Apple's doing today. Yeah. He just decides, you know, you know, I think that this is what its long-term value is, and it's far from that right now. And so I'm going to buy some Apple or, you know, short some Apple, and I'm going to, I'm going to sit on that for 10 or 20 years. Okay. So, when you're at that kind of time scale or e or even more than just a few days all kinds of other sources of risk and information you know so n now you're talking about holding things through recessions and economic cycles yeah. wars can break out so there you have to understand Politics. human nature at a level yeah that and you need to just be able to ingest many many more sources of data that are on wildly different time scales right so if i'm an hft i'm a high frequency trader like i don't i don't i really my main source of data is just the data from the exchanges themselves about the activity in the exchanges right and maybe I need to pay, you know, I need to keep an eye on the news, right? Because, you know, that can sudden cause sudden, you know, the, the, you know, CEO gets caught in a scandal or, you know, gets run over by a bus or something that can cause very sudden changes. And, but, but, you know, I don't need to understand economic cycles. I don't need to understand recessions. I don't need to worry about the political situation or war breaking out in this part of the world because, you know, all I need to know is as long as that's not going to happen, in the le next 500 milliseconds, then you know my model's good. When you get to these longer time scales, you really have to worry about that kind of stuff. And people in the machine learning community are starting to think about this. We we held a we we jointly sponsored a workshop at Penn with the um, Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia a little more than a year ago. On you know I think the title was something like machine learning for macroeconomic prediction. Um, you know, macroeconomic referring specifically to these longer time scales. And, you know, it was an interesting conference, but it, you know, my, it, it left me with greater confidence that we have a long way to go to, you know. And so I think that people that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, if, if so somebody asked me like, well, whose job on Wall Street is safe from the bots? Mm -hmm. I think people that are at that longer, you know, the time scale and have that appetite for all the risks involved in long-term investing and that really need kind of not just algorithms that can optimize from data, but they need views on stuff. They need views on the political landscape, economic cycles and the like. Um, and I think, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty safe for a while, as far as I can tell. So Warren Buffett's job is yeah, safe. Yeah, I'm not while. seeing, you know, a, a robo Warren Buffett anytime soon. Should give him cetera. What is differential privacy, or more broadly, algorithmic privacy? Algorithmic privacy, more broadly, is just the study or, or the notion of privacy definitions or norms being encoded inside of algorithms. And so, you know, I think we count among this body of work just, you know, the literature and practice of things like data anonymization, which we kind of at the beginning of our discussion of privacy say like, okay, this is, this is sort of a notion of algorithmic privacy. It kind of tells you, you know, something to go do with data. 
but but you know our view is that it's and I think it, this is now you know quite widespread that it's you know despite the fact that those notions of anonymization kind of redacting and coarsening um, are the most widely adopted technical solutions for data privacy they are like deeply fundamentally flawed and so you know to your first question what is differential privacy differential privacy seems to be a much much better notion of privacy that kind of avoids a lot of the weaknesses of anonymization notions while while still letting us do useful stuff with data what's anonymization of data so by anonymization i'm you know kind of referring to techniques like i have a database the rows of that database are let's say individual people's medical records okay and i i want to let people use that data maybe i want to let researchers access that data to build predictive models for some disease but i'm worried that that will leak you know sensitive information about specific people's medical records so anonymization broadly refers to the set of techniques where i say like okay i'm first going to like like i'm going to delete the column with people's names i'm going to not put you know so that would be like a redaction right i'm just redacting that information i am going to take ages and i'm not going to like say your exact age i'm going to say whether you're you know 0 to 10 10 to 20 20 to 30 i might put the first three digits of your zip code but not the last two etc cetera, etc cetera. and so the idea is that through some series of operations like this on the data i anonymize it you know another term of art that's used is removing personally identifiable information and you know this is basically the most common way of providing data privacy but that's in a way that still lets people access the some variant form of the data so at, at a slightly broader picture as you talk about what does anonymization mean when you have multiple databases like with a Netflix prize when you can start combining stuff together so to this is exactly the problem with these notions right is that notions of anon anonymization removing personally identifiable in information the kind of fundamental conceptual flaw is that you know these definitions kind of pretend as if the data set in question is the only data set that exists in the world or that ever will exist in the future and of course things like the netflix prize and many many other examples since the netflix prize i think that was one of the earliest ones though you know it, you can reidentify people that were you know that were anonymized in the data set by taking that anonymized data set and combining it with other allegedly anonymized data sets and maybe publicly available information about you you know and for people who don't know the netflix prize was what was being publicly released as data so the names from those rows were re removed but what was released is the preference or the ratings of what movies you like and you don't like and from that combined with other things i think forum posts and so on you can start to yeah, figure I mean, out that, the that names. case it was specifically the internet movie database the where database. where lots of netflix users publicly rate their you know their movie yeah. preferences and so the anonymized data in Netflix, when kind of, you know, it's it's just this phenomenon. I think that we've all come to realize in the last decade or so is that just knowing a few apparently irrelevant, innocuous things about you can often act as a fingerprint. Like if I know, you know, what what rating you gave to these ten movies and the date on which you entered these movies? This is almost like a fingerprint for you, yeah, is exactly. in the sea of all Netflix users. Yeah. There was just another paper on this in Science or Nature of, about a month ago, that you know, kind of eighteen attributes. I mean, my favorite example of this is was actually um, a paper um, from several years ago now, where it was shown that just from your likes on Facebook, just from the you know, the things on which you clicked on the thumbs up button on the platform, not using any information, demographic information, nothing about who your friends are, just knowing the content that you had liked um, was enough to, you know, in the aggregate, accurately predict things like sexual orientation, drug and alcohol use, whether you were the child of divorced parents. So we live in this era where, you know, even the apparently irrelevant data that we offer about ourselves on public platforms and forums, often unbeknownst to us, more or less acts as a signature or, you know, fingerprint 
and that if you can kind of you know do a join between that kind of data and allegedly anonymized data you have real trouble this touches another sort of related thing that you mentioned and that people might misinterpret from the title of your book ethical algorithm is it possible for the algorithm to automate some of those decisions sort of uh, higher level decisions of what kind of like what what, what should be fair or what, what should be fair the more you know about a field the more aware you are of its limitations and so i'm a, i'm pretty leery of sort of trying you know there's there's so much we don't all we already don't know in yeah. fairness even when we're the ones picking the fairness definitions and you know comparing alternatives and thinking about the tensions between different definitions that the idea of kind of letting the algorithm start exploring as well i definitely think you know this is a much narrower statement i definitely think that kind of algorithmic auditing for different types of unfairness right so like in this gerrymandering example where i might want to prevent not just discrimination against very broad categories but against combinations of broad categories you know you quickly get to a point where there's a lot of a lot of categories there's a lot of combinations of n features and you know you can use algorithmic techniques to sort of try to find the subgroups on which you're discriminating the most and try to fix that that's actually kind of the form of one of the algorithms we developed for this fairness gerrymandering problem but i'm i'm you know partly because of our technology you know sort of our scientific ignorance on these topics right now and also partly just because these topics are so loaded emotionally for people that i just don't see the value i mean again never say never but i just don't think we're at a moment where it's a great time for computer scientists to be rolling out the idea like hey you know you know not only have we kind of figured fairness out but you know we think the algorithms should start deciding what's fair or or giving input on that decision i just don't <laughs> it's like the the cost benefit analysis to the field of kind of going there right now just doesn't seem worth it to me that said I, can you describe what the uh knuth morris pratt algorithm does and how did you come to develop it one of the many things that you're known for it has your name attached to it. Yeah, all right. So it should be actually Morris Pratt Knuth, <laughs> but we decided to use alphabetical order when we published the paper. The problem is uh, something that everybody knows now if they're if they're using a search engine. Uh, uh, you have a, a a large collection of text, and you want to know if if the word Knuth appears anywhere in the text, to say, or, or or some some other word that's less interesting than Knuth. Okay? But anyway, <laughs> that's like, the most interesting like word. Like Morris yeah. or something. Like Morris, so, right? <laughs> so anyway, we have we have a, a large piece of text, in it, and it, it's all one long, one-dimensional thing. You know, first letter, second letter, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, the the question you, you, you'd like to be able to do this quickly. Um, and the obvious way is, uh, th let's say we're looking for Morris. Then, okay, no, there. so we would we would go through and wait till we get to letter M. Then we look at the next word, and sure enough, it's an O, and then an R. But then, the, whoop, too bad. Um, uh, the next letter is is E. Mm -hmm. So we missed we we missed out on Morris. And so uh, we go back and start looking for another. Okay. All over again. So that's the obvious way to do it. Yeah. All right. Um, and and Jim Morris noticed there was a more clever way to do it. The obvious way would have started. Let's say we you know, we found that letter M at character position one thousand. Mm -hmm. so, so it would have started next at character position one thousand and one. Mm -hmm. But but he, but he said, no. Look, we we already read the O and the R, and we know that they aren't M's, so we can we can start. Uh, we don't have to read those over again. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, and, and this gets pretty tricky when when the word isn't Morris, but it's more like abracadabra, where you have patterns that are occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like repeating patterns re in the, at the beginning, at the middle, right? The end. So, right. So, 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 um, he he worked it out, and he put it into the system software at Berkeley, I think it was, where he was uh, 
he was writing some Berkeley Unix, I think, was some routine that was supposed to find occurrences of patterns in text. And 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 um, but he didn't explain it. And, and and so he found out that several months later somebody had had looked at it, didn't look right, and so they ripped it out. So he had this this algorithm, but it didn't make it through, uh, <laughs> you know, because it wasn't understood. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew about this particularly. Uh, Vaughn Pratt also had independently discovered it a year or two later. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget why. I think Vaughn was studying some technical problem about palindromes or something like that. He wasn't really, it, he, Vaughn wasn't working on on text searching, but he was working on a, on an abstract problem that, ha that that was related. Well, at that time, Steve Cook was a professor at Berkeley, uh, and uh, uh, it was the greatest mistake that Berkeley CS department made was not to give him tenure. Mm -hmm. and so Steve went to went to Toronto, but um, but I but I knew Steve while he was at Berkeley, and he had come up with a with a very peculiar theorem. Uh, about a technical concept called a stack automaton, mm. and a stack automaton it is a machine that that ha it can't do everything a Turing machine can do, but it, it it can only look at something on at the top of a stack, or it can put more things on the stack, or or, or it can take things off of the stack. Like it it can't remember a, a long string of symbols. But but it can remember them in reverse order. So so, so if you tell a stack automaton A B C D E, it it can it can tell you afterwards E E D C B A. Uh, it, you know it doesn't have any other memory except except this one thing that it can see. And and Steve Cook proved this amazing thing that says if a stack automaton can recognize a language where where the strings of the language are length n in any um, amount of time whatsoever. So, so the stack automaton might use a zillion steps. A regular computer can recognize that same language in time, n log n. So Steve had a way of transforming a, a, a computation that goes on and on and on and on in, in, into using different data structures into something that you can do on a regular computer mm -hmm. uh, fast. The, the stack automaton goes slow, but 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 somehow the fact that it can do it at all m means that there has to be a fast way. Hmm. So I thought this was a pretty you know cool theorem, uh, and so I tried it out on on a problem where I knew a, a stack automaton could do it, but I couldn't figure out a fast way to do it on a regular computer. I I thought I was a pretty good programmer, but but by golly, I couldn't think of any way to. To recognize this language efficiently, mm -hmm. so I went through Steve Cook's construction. I filled my blackboard with all the everything that Stack Automaton did. Did you know? I I wrote down and and then I tried to see patterns in that, and and how did he convert that into a computer program on a regular machine? Um, and <laughs> finally, I psyched it out. What was the, what was the thing I was missing so yeah. that I could say, oh yeah, this is what I should do in my program, uh, and, and now I have an efficient program, and and so I, um, uh, I I would never have thought about uh, that if I hadn't ha had his theorem, which was purely abstract thing. So well, you used this theorem wrote, to, to to try to intuit how to use the stack automaton for the the string matching problem. I, yeah. So, 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 so the the problem I I, I had started w with was not the string matching problem. But then I realized that the string matching problem was another thing, which would also be could be done by a stack automaton. And, and so, when when I looked at what that told me, then I had a nice algorithm for this string matching problem, uh, and 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 it told me exactly what I should remember as I'm as I'm going through the string. And I worked it out, and and I wrote this little paper called "Automata Theory Can Be Useful," and 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 the reason was that it was first. I mean, I had been reading all kind of papers about automata theory, uh, 
but it never taught me. It it, it never improved my programming for for, for everyday problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was something that you, you published in journals, and, and 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 you know it was it, it was interesting stuff. But it, it but here was a case where I c- couldn't figure out how to write the program. I had a theorem from automata theory. Then I knew how to write the program. Mm-hmm. So this was a, for me. Uh, uh, you know, a, ch- a change in life. I started to say maybe I should l- learn more about Thomas. And 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 I I showed this note to Vaughn Pratt, and he said he that's sim- similar to something I was working on. Um, and then uh, and, and Jim Morris was at at Berkeley too at the time. But anyway, he he had, he's had an illustrious career, but I haven't kept track of Jim. But Vaughn is my colleague at Stanford. Mm-hmm. And, and my student um, later, but but this was before Vaughn Vaughn was still a graduate student and hadn't come to Stanford yet. So we found out that we had all been working on the same thing. So so it was our algorithm. We had each discovered it independently, but each of us had had discovered a different a different part of the elephant, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, a different aspect of it. And so we could put our 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 things together. It was my job to write the paper. How did the elephant spring to life? Spring to life was because I, I had drafted this paper, automata theory. Oh, it can be useful, which was seen by Vaughn and then by Jim, and then 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 we combined because maybe they had also been thinking of writing something up about it about specifically the string matching problem. Specifically the string matching problem and a, a period translation and much more.